evening and welcome to tonight's regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. We have a crowd here tonight. Uh, uh, first thing, order business, ask them to turn off their cell phones. We don't interfere with our RFP to <coughs> mics. And then secondly, uh, join us in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. With that, Mr. Secretary, will you call the roll? Gladly. President Wasserman. Yes. Vice, <laughs> Vice President Baker, we know what you mean. Here. Secretary Kaminsky, I'm here. Treasurer Brandstamp. Here. Member Gorton. Here. Member McFarland. Here. And Member Vanderkill. Here. Seven out of seven. Thank you. Uh, moving on, the first item on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda that's uh, printed in front of you. Uh, it contains approval of the me last meeting minutes, uh, bids for uh, copy paper, textbook approval that have been presented to us in the past, uh, compliance with Public Act 55, the District School Improvement Committee reviewed and gave feedback for all the school improvement uh, plans by the committees and uh, district improvement plan. We'll be approving that this evening. Following staff members. Two staff members announcing um, resignations. Uh, the staffing letters for next year, uh, we'll be approving that in this. And those are attached to your agenda. And lastly, approval of legal fees to true law firm of $2,900 and $54. Uh, take a motion for the consent. I move to approve the consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.7 as indicated in the agenda. Support. support. Moved by Member of Farmland, support by Treasurer Brandstat. Uh, any questions and or deletions or additions one would like to make to the consent agenda while we're here? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. At this point, we move into the portion of the meeting where we just uh, for uh, folks to talk to the board. Uh, does anybody care to address the board? And if you do, please state your name, your attendance area, please. Ah, Rick, oh, okay, Rick had one in advance, did not see the agenda, thank you. We had another member of the audience raise their hand as well, yeah. Chair, just so you know. Good evening. Last week, both Midland High and Dow High had graduation ceremonies a time of celebration for the accomplishments of students and their families. One small group of people may be overlooked in the celebration, however. As this district has weathered its battering at the hands of the state of Michigan, difficult decisions have been made time and again. Eventually, we will be faced with a set of bad choices, but tonight, I congratulate the board on a prior decision. The small group of people who demonstrated literal, not figurative, toil, sweat, and tears I have no knowledge of blood, are the high school counselors. Counseling is not a job as much as it is a calling, and our high school counselors were called upon again and again and again as they worked behind the scenes to give each student the best opportunity to graduate. The number of students who were lifted up by the actions of these counselors runs easily into double digits, but you wouldn't know it. For Craig Hawkins, Nancy Bussineau, and Misty Tyson at Midland High, and for Lori Hallberg, Jill English, and Doug Bradford at Dow High, helping kids find their way is an everyday thing. This time of year, it just happens that their job is heroic, and having counselors changes students' lives. I just thought you should know, they won't tell you, because counselors don't have the ego for it. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much, Rick, and I think we all concur. Anybody else from the audience <coughs> want to speak? Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Kramer. My daughter, Taylor, is a Midland High freshman. She has a course study focused on the pursuit of the International Baccalaureate Diploma offered at, by the school. We attended an informational meeting a few months ago by the Great Lakes Bay Early College. After looking at the program and its level of success, she applied. 
after a few weeks, she was notified that she would not be able to attend. We contacted the Great Lakes Bay Admission Department and asked why. We have been told that they have many spots available for the Midland schools, but the Midland schools are not going to utilize them. Roughly half will be filled as per the school administration. My question to the board is why my daughter does not get the opportunity as opposed to any other student who may be attending. Any student who is trying to get the best education available should have that opportunity. Thank you. Um, we normally don't get into a dialogue where we could be here all night on some folks, so I'll uh, have you talk to Mr. Ellinger again in the future, but Carl, you may have a comment on the early program. I think program. Mike, was it you and I that talked last week on the phone? Yeah. Yeah, and I think it was at my suggestion and your own initiative that you chose to contact uh, Mrs. Searles at the program, correct? Correct. Yeah, I'm glad you did that. There, like you and I mentioned on the phone, there has been some history of um, uh, miscommunication between how they portray the program and how we portray it, what the agreement has been since the board signed on to participate two years ago. You and I talked about that. I think what might be at issue here is exactly did your daughter hit the deadline for the number of students that we chose or didn't she? Is that where some of this confusion is coming from? As far as they're concerned, she did. She was the best. Yeah, and, and every district has as an allowance by participating to set their own deadlines. And in fact, they had their own original deadlines were in March. <coughs> and when they weren't drawing the number of students that they hoped to get, they changed those to May. So why don't you and I do some follow-up and determine exactly where in that your daughter's application fell. And then I'll get back to you. I'll give you a call tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anybody else here to address the board? Mr. Kramer, thanks for your questions. Okay, with that, uh, seeing none, we'll move into Board of Education matters and presentations of the board. Um, turn this over to Mr. Ellinger. Uh, actually, it's going to be real easy for me to turn over to uh, Mrs. Greif. Um, we had the opportunity to, uh, I guess, uh, about a year and a half, to, about a year and a half uh -huh. ago, to approach the uh, Gerstacker Foundation um, uh, about funding uh, a grant for Midland Public Schools, but really Midland High School, because this idea came out of Midland High School. We received a grant for $100,000 uh, to support the effort. Uh, Mrs. Greif and I traveled to Taiwan um, last spring, and the first step to uh, work on a staff and student exchange had uh, Mrs. Greif and some teachers and students um, make the trip here about a month ago to uh, Taiwan, and they're here to share that experience with you. So with that, Mrs. Greif, we're looking forward to hearing that. Great, and I'll just add that um when uh, Mr. Ellinger and I went, actually it's a lot of help from Saginaw Valley. I'd like to certainly plug them. They helped arrange, and we actually have an exchange program with a school called Fuxing Private School. It's a private school in Taipei, which is the capital. It's a K-12 school, and there are 3,000 students that attend. And I brought with me this evening, they'll come from around, um, the five teachers and five students who participated. It is Melissa Toner, Monique Albright, Marnie Mar uh, Malakara, Mary Hillman, Georgina Leach, uh, Nate Fisher, Eddie Mulford, Emily Kessler, Elizabeth Ladwig, Melinda Kothbauer, and did I think that, did I get everyone? Did I get, name everybody? I think so, there's the five teachers, and actually, this is kind of an upbeat thing, and I'm gonna actually let them, since I had the opportunity to go with them, but I'm gonna let each of them share a little piece of what we learned those two weeks we were there. Hi there. I'm going to talk about the geography of Taiwan. Um, in case you didn't know, it's there we go. Located in um, South Asia, it's about 112 miles off of the southeast coast of China. Um, it is an island nation. It used to be called Formosa, which means beautiful island in Portuguese. Um, it's about 245 miles long and about 85 miles wide. There's 23 million people that live there. Um, their population density is a, a little slightly less than 2,000 people per square mile. Compare that to 84 here in the United States. Um, it's the size slightly smaller than Maryland and Delaware combined. It is highly urbanized. 
Um, we took this shot on uh, Taipei 101, which is the second largest building in the world. Um, from 2004 to 2010, it was considered the largest. As you can see, Taipei is the capital where we stayed, and it is um, within rolling hills, and it's beautiful. It stretches over a, a vast area. Nine million people alone live there. Um, it's island nation, so you can see from the picture there. And um, this is uh, just the countryside. Um, about two-thirds of the country lives to the, uh, or excuse me, about 90% of the population lives in the eastern portion of, or excuse me, the western portion of Taiwan in about one-third of the land area, which is lowlands and rolling hills. And then there are five mountain ranges there. They have about 1,000 earthquakes a year that the people can detect, um, but they have built their structures to withstand that. Um, this is a dam, a large reservoir in the north. Um, it provides uh, electricity to about 3 million people in northern Taiwan. Um, it's considered a great tourist destination along with the electricity it generates and flood control kind of does it all. So that's just a snapshot of the geography of Taiwan. So this is Taipei uh, Fuxing Private School and the students had the opportunity to study there for the first week of our time in Taiwan and the teachers got to share their experiences with other teachers who were there. So that was really awesome. and. Um, uh, this is the 11th grade class in the bilingual division of the school. And the bilingual division really stresses English and they have incredible English skills because they really teach that in every class. And in fact, they actually translated for us in most of our classes, which was really, really nice. They were really welcoming and tried to make us have the best experience we could possibly have. And um, we got really close with our class and I think there are some pictures on the next slide too that show that. <laughs> Uh, we had a 10 hour school day, so we had plenty of time to get to know them. And we really had um, just an incredible experience getting to know all of the kids. That was the best part for all of the students, just the friendships that we made with all of the kids. And we still talk to a lot of the kids from the class. So we built really lasting friendships. And we really had an authentic experience going to school with them because we went to the same classes that our host students went to and we got to see really a well-rounded education that they had. We had different classes every day, so it was really interesting getting to experience that alongside our host students. So expounding more on what Elizabeth was saying. Uh, we met some really good friends, not only the people that we actually stayed with, our host families, but we also met a lot of other cool kids that were in the class. After school each day, it was we would get out of school at about 5.30, which is really late. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I think 2.30 is late sometimes. <laughs> but uh, we would go right from school to dinner oftentimes, and it wouldn't just be us five, us five students with our five host students. It would be a large group such as this of people from their class that would be so eager to come with us. We wouldn't even have to invite them. They would just be happy to come along. And some cool things that we ate was, you can see this shaved ice, and that was delicious, and it was really nice because it was often very humid and often around 90 degrees, so it was nice to have a nice, cool snack. And here, we went to a night market, which I describe it as a combination of a flea market, a carnival, and a farmer's market. And they have any kind of food you could think of there from the craziest things I've ever seen to <laughs> just some normal chicken. <laughs> I thought it was normal, but. Uh, and you could also buy a ton of different things. And it was, it was very busy, I'll say that. And we also went to Taipei 101, as was formerly mentioned. We went with the students, and there was a group of probably around 20 students that went there. So it was a lot of fun meeting a lot of them. And we still talk to those people too, not only our host students themselves, but their friends that we met. So that was really cool. Um, one uh, really interesting thing that we found about the education system in Taiwan, at least in this school, was that it was uh, very focused on holistic education. And so they were really all about blending um, old traditions with new technologies. And so as you can see in the upper right and uh, upper left corners, that those are some traditional Chinese instruments that the students take lessons in once or twice a week as part of their normal academic schedule. Um, along with that, we also did calligraphy uh, class one, one time while we were there. Um, they do that about once or twice a week again, too. Um, they really stress that for these students, especially in the bilingual school, because these uh, the 
students in the bilingual school will be traveling abroad for college. They are um, required to, that's why they're in the bilingual school. And so we thought that that was really interesting. Um, another thing that we found there was that they were very focused on teaching not only academic courses, but also they taught morals and character in the school as well, which is very different than we find here in America. Um, as you can see in this picture here, that is a traditional Confucian play that was teaching, uh, it was, uh, I believe, in the elementary school. The teachers saw it, but it was teaching morals to all the other students, and that was something that they focused on as well. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see Mrs. Greif. Uh, she's actually video conferencing with NASA up in the space station. So um, it was very interesting because they're, they're all about the new technologies as well. So another thing they did was they have a green room where they make uh, about three times a week, they make a broadcast that's like an announcement for the entire school. So a different grade is responsible for it at uh, different times of the year. And so that was really interesting too. Um, we had actually made a PowerPoint presentation to show to them about Midland and they showed it on there and it was really cool. So we got to share about Midland with the entire school. Another part of their holistic education was an outdoor center. Uh, it was located about 45 minutes away from their downtown campus. And it was there that the students learned about their outdoor skills. While we were there, we actually participated in their ropes course as a team bonding experience. And as you can see here, we uh, were able to climb up these tall poles and work together as a group. And part of their education is because a lot of these kids live in downtown uh, Taipei, they don't get enough outdoors or like farming experiences. They don't have that culture behind it, but their uh, school system wants to educate them on that. So they learn not only how to cook and to farm, but also a lot of other uh, traditional values and outdoor skills. And part of their education to graduate is they actually have to climb the tallest mountain in Taiwan, and that takes them a while, but they all are able to do it. <laughs> and uh, in the lower right-hand corner on that day, we also visited a 100-year-old Chinese restaurant, and the food there was delicious. <laughs> and yep. All right, um, over the weekend, we had a little bit of free time. So um, actually, my host dad planned this trip for all of us, uh, just the students. We went to um, a city called Tainan, which is in southern um, Taiwan. So we got to take the high-speed train there. And it was really cool because we were in the city most of the time. So we got to see a different culture, a different section of Taiwan, and the more rural area. Um, here you can see we went with our host students, and um, we went to Chinese palaces, Dutch palaces. We visited, um, I think, two different um, Buddhist temples. They were just gorgeous, breathtaking. The picture doesn't really show how beautiful it is, but it was um, amazing. And we got to see a lot of the existing or the original um, structures. And it was a really great bonding experience. We played lots of games with our um, the host students on the train, w train down there and really got to see the history and the culture behind Taiwan. Uh, while we were there, we got to visit Minchuan University. Uh, Minchuan University was founded in 1957. It was originally a women's business school. Uh, in 2010, it became the first US accredited institution in all of Asia. Uh, you can see right here, here we all are, and this is uh, Dr. Lee, president of the university, and next to him is his wife, Dr. Shin. Um, it was a, kind of a special treat. He took time out of his day. We weren't planning on seeing him, and when we got up for lunch, there he was, and Mrs. Greif was, was shocked, but very <laughs> pleased to see him. Um, while we were there at the lunch, we had a traditional box lunch, and what was fabulous about it is that, well, the, the food was really good, but the cheesecake was made right there at the university. They had a full, full, full blown kitchen, I guess, and the students there make their own food to serve at the university, which was very nice. Um, that's a picture of all of us after our three-hour Mandarin lesson. Um, <laughs> we're still smiling, so uh, yeah, that was uh, that was that uh, was that was hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the top, um, a couple of their classrooms were really unique. They had an airline hospitality classroom, and actually, the classroom was set up like an airplane. You'd sit down in air airplane seats, and you could like look over the window, which was a screen, and it looked like you were taking off, and the the um, they had students dressed as stewardesses greeting you. Um, 
They believe in authentic education. They want to immerse you in the act actual situation. So they had a classroom like that. For the airline, they also had one for a restaurant, um, kind of like a little cafe was set up and we had some coffee there. It was a really nice experience. Um, there's a couple of other classrooms that were really neat. Uh, this was the U.S. history classroom. Um, they wanted to give you a, a feeling of actually being there. They had the, the hallways decorated with paintings and murals of American history. They also had a Japanese culture room with all the decor uh, that would go along with the Japanese culture. We, you could see the students there. They're all they're, they're kneeling, and they had a lot of artifacts in the back. Um, down there, that is the classroom I was talking about, the, the restaurant hospitality. And then this was when Dr. Shen took us out to lunch. We had a, a fabulous lunch, um, just great food. Uh, she was the most gracious host. And uh, again, Dr. Lee, it was very nice to meet him. On our last full day, we uh, toured Dayun International Senior High School. They are known for promoting internationalism by requiring that their students take a second foreign language beyond English. So beyond English, they're also taking either Japanese, French, German, or Spanish. Uh, while we were at Dayu, the students actually toured us around and really got involved with us while we were there, and they taught us some traditional games. You will see Miss Emily over here. She is shooting a tapioca ball out of a straw <laughs> in at a target. In the corner, we have some Dayu students uh, teaching us a traditional dice game. And we had a chance to observe a classroom. This was an art classroom. And our students were able to fully participate in the actual lesson, so it was fun to watch them engage with the Dayun students there. And then Mrs. Greif is pictured with Dr. Shen from Minchuan University and also the principal of Dayun International High School. During our time in Taiwan, we were able to experience the culture firsthand. The top left picture is the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall, where we spent some time watching a changing of the guard. It reminded me a lot of our Lincoln Memorial. We also went to the Keelung Harbor where there was an 82 foot statue of the Goddess of Mercy. We also were able to witness a Buddhist temple while we were there. The middle two pictures, we did a lot of shopping while we were there, um, spent um, some tourist money. We went to both the um, old city shopping as well as the night markets. Scooters were quite prevalent in Taiwan, as you can see in the top right-hand slide, you saw scooters weaving in and out of traffic. You saw business suits on scooters. You saw rain slickers on scooters. You just saw scooters everywhere. We also had the opportunity to have someone who was an actual practice, practicing Buddhist take us to the Longshan Temple, where she was able to describe at great detail um, what her religion kind of consisted of, as well as explain some of the gods um, that she specifically prayed to, which was a really fabulous opportunity. That was Vicki. Um, she was actually from the um, private school again that we were at. While we were there, we were able to make pottery. We visited a gold mining town. We also got a chance to see a rice paddy field. Dr. Shen from Min Chuang University treated us to a 12-course meal. I can honestly say that was my first 12-course meal that I've ever had. <laughs> and it was, it, I mean, it was fabulous. It was fabulous. But if you take a look at the picture, the, the thing I really want to point out is the fact that there's this huge Lazy Susan. If you take a look at how large that table is, there, if you look at how large that table is, there were 20 people surrounding the table, and the Lazy Susan would spin around, and you can kind of pick and choose what meal you wanted off from it. We also had the opportunity to visit the Presidential Office of Taiwan, which was a very unique and exciting opportunity for us. It's very similar to our White House. We also learned quite a bit about Taiwan's history by visiting a f local fort, and we also spent some time in the mine areas, and so we saw some of the farming and the residents working through their gardens while we were there. Food. Um, <laughs> what else can I say? We ate our way through Taiwan, literally. <laughs> and I think some of you probably might, those of you following Facebook probably saw a lot of the other food pictures as well. Another thing that I think that us students really learned from it is how awesome their families are. 
each of us was treated like a rock star in their family, <laughs> honestly. They were so welcoming to us, and they just – we didn't have to do anything to them. They just loved us. And <laughs> uh, here you can see uh, – this is their elementary school students. Uh, they're playing tug-of-war against some possibly rival classes. And their parents would come from their work day to watch their students just in a tug-of-war contest. But that kind of gets – it shows you how important family is over there. I think we all experience that and how here some some students, some kids might talk back to their parents, but there they just did what their parents said, no questions asked, and I'm sure <laughs> some parents here might wish that was, I hope that was the same here. <laughs> I think uh, for me, and I think I can speak maybe for the whole group here, is I think the biggest takeaway for us were all the human connections that we made and the friendships throughout. And so we wanted to highlight some of the people that made this just absolutely unforgettable for everybody. So in the upper left picture is uh, Principal Greif, and she is with Dr. Lee, who's principal of Booth Think. And we're hoping to keep a connection between um, Dr. Lee and the high school, make it maybe our sister high school, so we can keep this exchange going on for several years yet. In the middle upper picture is Mrs. Greif, and she's with President Lee, president of the Minshuan University. Minshuan University is the sister school for Saginaw Valley State University, so very instru instrumental in making this whole connection happen for <coughs> us. In the upper right corner are our friends, and that is Vicki and Jens. Vicki is fluent in English, and so she would travel with us on many of the sites that we went to see, and she also taught us about the Buddhism that um, Mrs. Hillman talked about earlier, and Jens. He was our driver, he was our tour guide, he was with us every day, and he just took care of us. He was like our big dad there, so he was fabulous. In the bottom corner, we have a picture of a dinner that we hosted to thank all the parents and the students from Pusing, and so you'll see some of the parents that were able to make it that evening. In the bottom middle is our very dear friend, Dorcas Ron. And Dorcas, she put this whole program together. She was in constant contact with Mrs. Greif before we went to Taiwan. And while we were there, she built itineraries from, from sunup to sundown. She kept us busy. Uh, the next two pictures, um, the first one next to um, Dorcas is our friend, Angela. And not far from home, it's a small world. Angela's from Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And she is a kindergarten teacher at Fu Singh. Uh, we hope to be able to see her this summer while she visits her family here in Michigan. And the last one on the right is our friend Zoe, who is also fluent in English and traveled with us, with us throughout the site. And the next two slides, this is just kind of wrapping up everything and um, bringing um, some of the memorable spots together. These two pictures on the left are from Jingua Shi, the beautiful um, mountainous waterfalls. I think that was my most favorite thing, and I think a lot of people could agree. This is outside the gold mines. In the upper right corner, we had visited the National Palace Museum and toured through the museum and bought a lot of gifts at the gift shop. And in the bottom right corner was the Pusing Outdoor Education Center where we had the ropes course, and that's all the staff that was there to greet us. And just some more candid shots, the teachers and Mrs. Greif at Keelung Harbor, the kids at Fisherman's Wharf on the River of Tansui, which is a uh, favorite destination from, the city, from people that live in the city of Taipei in the summertime they visit. Um, some candid shots of our kids at Fort Santo Domingo, and another shot of the teachers and Mrs. Greif at the uh, president's office in Taiwan. All right, uh, this is an overview of some of the ideas that culminated from our experience with our colleagues in Taiwan. And as you can see, uh, that slide was in earlier in our presentation. It's Mrs. Greif uh, video conferencing with NASA. The technology allowed for the NASA teacher to interact one-on-one -on -one and as a group with the entire classroom, uh, students and teachers. And so our plans are to video conference with Fuxing and Mingxuan University and possibly some other educational venues. For example, we plan to video conference with Fuxing in a venue where the Fuxing students will participate in lessons taught by Midland teachers. And then uh, Midland High School stu students will be taught by teachers at Fuxing. And we plan to communicate with, uh, in a similar way, with Mingshan University and their education students. Another great opportunity that came out of our experience is that Fuxing invited Midland teachers to come in the summer to teach English, offering another chance for us to um, learn more about their culture and exchange ideas. And then we're very excited that in the fall, Fuxing teachers and students will come to Midland High School, and this will be 
exciting for everyone because our entire staff and student body will get to meet their students and teachers and share in our experiences with them. And uh, while we were at Fuxing, we visited a room that was dedicated to highlighting the school's history. It included a timeline of events and artifacts related to the school from the time it began until now. And we really liked that idea of setting aside a special place uh, to highlight these types of things. And we plan to designate a room at Midland High School to designate our history and accomplishments and kind of highlight those things. And this was, this was really fun, <laughs> the green screening room. Um, earlier you saw a picture of our students, or maybe not a picture, but we talked about it, of our students um, that helped in a video production of Fuxing's school announcements and news. And to give you a little bit of a background, the green screening room has the green background so, that, background, so it gives you minimal light reflection and it gives you a clear presentation. So you can also digitally impose like um, various backgrounds and special effects. And so there are lots of ways that you can use this room. But one application that we plan to utilize at Midland High School is a live streaming production of our announcements and school news. And then lastly, while we were in Taiwan, we noticed the beauty of the landscape. And when we visited all of the schools, we noticed that they brought nature inside and outside of their school campus. And all you know is conducive for a positive learning environment. And so this fall, we're going to be starting a Midland High um, Beautification Club. And our hope is that we'll spark an interest for a variety of students and staff helping us to incorporate some ideas um, to provide nature inside and outside of our school. Like we're hoping that we'll get some students with welding experience, construction experience, hopefully those with um, maybe some art design types of ideas to help us build gardenscapes, landscaping, and um, maybe add some garden art. And then we're hoping those that just have a general interest in gardening and beautifying our campus that would join. Um, one of the ideas that we've come up with is to start out small, maybe is to have uh, plants in every classroom and then maybe incorporate some international gardens throughout our campus. If you look on the right hand side of the screen, there's a picture from Ming Shuan University. They had a little corner where they had a Japanese garden. So with that, we can maybe promote um, international or global feel throughout the, the school. So um, we have lots of ideas that came from our trip and our experiences with our friends in Taiwan. And this is just an overview of the things that we want to try to implement in the fall. Um, I have the long slide here to thank everybody. <coughs> and um, obviously, I'm going to read it very fast. But I know that the people at Min Shuan probably in Fuxing will probably watch this online. So I want to make sure. And I, I know I'll forget somebody, then I'll be sorry. but. Um, obviously, the Gersacker Foundation, um, Mr. Ellinger, because he helped set it up with uh, me last year, Dr. Uh, Robert Yen from SVSU, who also splits his time between uh, SVSU and Minshuan, um, Dr. Uh, Robert Morovich and Carolyn Weirder from SVSU, who were part of the Gersacker program that um, Amy, Carol, and I were all involved with, that also helped us make some connections. Dr. Phoebe Lee, who is the principal of Fuxing, um, Dorcas uh, Run, who really was the person that I communicated. In fact, I'm going to Skype with her tomorrow to get some more things um, going for the summer school, hopefully. And so she really was really integral. She did all the agenda. She was very, very busy. And all the staff, students, and parents at, at uh, Fuxing, along with Dr. Lee and his wife at Minshuan University, and all the staff and students there couldn't have been friendlier, and also uh, the international school we visited. I have to say that um, I've traveled some in my life, and I have never met, no matter where we went, whether the high schools, I think everyone will agree, when we were in restaurants, I've never met a more gracious people than I met in Taiwan, and I think everyone will agree, very generous, gracious, and welcoming. It must be, I don't know, they must really promote that somehow, because it sure comes across in every facet of the community. Um, so you can see we had a great time. Um, we're, hope, we're hoping they're coming in the fall, and we're going to go back again next spring. And we'd be happy to entertain any questions if anyone has any questions. I do. Anybody for questions? Go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. I have a question for a, uh, one of the uh, teachers <coughs> that went and a question for one of the students. Sure. Um, just curious, as far as teachers in teaching, what thing did they learn that MPS could benefit from? I know you mentioned the, gar the green room and the gardens and things like that, but as far as, you know, could it be curriculum? Could it be anything that along the lines that you thought, wow, we could do this in uh, Midland Public? 
but in the teaching staff or Mrs. Gray? Gray. <laughs> Sometimes the curriculum was a bit challenging because it wasn't always in our language. So, you know, Mandarin, it was kind of hard to always figure that out. But I thought um, we saw all walks of, of teaching there just like you would see here. I think, um, I think implementing more character education would be great and really emphasizing integrity and honesty and um, caring for one another I think was was huge. Um, it was just the aesthetic environment of just the nature was really a wonderful thing as well. Um, they, they had excellent teachers there, but we also have excellent teachers here. To, so I see that, but I think that the character education was really key to how the culture, they just care for each other and, and are very welcoming and um, it's just very kind and everyone's so polite and that is definitely ingrained in the culture and I think that would be a, a huge piece that we could work on. I would also add the emphasis on internationalism that they really look at all different cultures and really respect and honor all different cultures. So that would be the piece that I think that was pretty prevalent in the schools. How about your student question? Yes, uh, for the students, uh, just the thing that they would like to see as a student that you think MPS could benefit from, the one thing that you saw from a student's perspective or viewpoint. Well, one thing that I thought was very um, unique, well, it's not necessarily unique, but that I really enjoyed at my time at Fuxing was that the schedule was very varied. They, it was more like a college uh, class schedule where it had they had different classes at different times each day. So they may have math every day of the week, but they had it at different times throughout the day. And I thought that that kind of, um, it added interest to the schedule because they, and they didn't always have the same classes at the same time. So it added kind of, yeah, variety to the, to the day, to each day. The nap time was also very nice. <laughs> we could uh, implement that. Um, no wonder, no wonder I don't that went over well. To 5:30 to have a nap, but the nap was nice. Can, can you talk a little bit about the length of the day? What time do students arrive at school? When do they go home? What kind of after-school activities do they have? Sure. Um, as far as extracurriculars went, uh, I thought that was very different than here. They um, they did not have extracurriculars. Um, they really included any kind of that type of thing was in the school day, so they had their music class, but everyone participated in it, and they had PE class, and everyone participated in it. It was um, it's, it was less individualistic than here, so you had a whole, the whole class was doing the same thing, but they did have those types of things integrated into the normal school day. Um, there, I believe they did have a basketball team, though, but they actually met at about 6 o'clock in the morning every day to practice. They didn't have it after school. Um, the day they got there at about, usually, I think we left, my, my student and I left our house about 6.50, and we got there um, about 7.10-ish. And so uh, the, state, the day actually started at 7.20, but that was from 7.20 to about 8.20 was a, a open study session. And then if they had a, a test that day, sometimes they would take it then rather than in the class period. So if they had a math test that was scheduled for that day, they would take it in the morning rather than in the scheduled math time. Um, and then it went to about 5.30 with, um, they did have a, like a 30 minute lunch and then a 40 minute nap time. So it was a very long day, but there were several breaks in between classes, about 10 or 15 minute breaks in between each class. So it was bearable. I mean, it was much different than here, but it was, it was, it was different, but it was good, so. Thank you. Were some of the classes held at the outdoor center? Um, I believe that they had different groups because it was a K through 12 school. They had different groups going there every day. It was about 40 minutes out of the city. How did you get there? We went by bus. They had a, a, their type of school bus. So and that's how their students regularly get there. I believe so. Yep. And uh, but they so I believe about once or twice a semester the students would go for the entire day and do different various activities there. Um, and sometimes they would stay overnight for a multiple day, maybe a weekend. But it varied by semester to semester so. So it's called the private school what type of kids go to that school like what makes it a private school and um, well it's a it's obviously you're right in Taipei so it's a pretty expensive place to live so okay I believe the tuition's about ten thousand dollars a year US okay that gives you some kind of an idea K and k-12 and the school is broke up with the there's one part that's bilingual and then one part that is not. Okay. And actually our students were with a group of 33 juniors. Is that correct? Was it 33 in your class? And those same 33 spent almost the entire day together. So it's a little bit different. There wasn't so much changing like we do. And actually the students 
primarily, other than a couple of the music classes, the students stay in the classroom and the teachers come in and out. Any other questions? Lynn? I know I talked to some of you earlier, and um, when you talk about a 10-hour day, so what does homework look like? Oh and for a teacher, and even for the teachers, the, pr the prep, that's a long day. Okay, um, I think that we didn't really necessarily see exactly how much homework they had while we were there because they were really trying to make sure that we had a good time. And so I think that they maybe didn't do as much of their homework as they normally would have done. But they, they did have quite a bit of, I mean, they didn't have a lot of time for after school activities because they had to go home and do homework and they were already home pretty late. And then they also had, um, they were very focused on the SAT and preparing for that. And so they had tutors and they had tutors for the regular classes as well, like math tutors. And, um, and so I know my host student had a three hour tutor one night when I was there. And so, you know, she just had her tutor and then she went to bed. And so there, there was quite a bit of continued learning after school. And then, um, also, I just wanted to say back to what we can gain from their education system there. Uh, I really enjoyed how well-rounded their education was, and I think Melinda kind of touched on that. Uh, when we were there during the one week that we were in school, the entire week, there was a class meeting and a school meeting, and I just thought that was really interesting. They really wanted to make their school kind of a family, and so there was just a lot of um, you know, moral education and then also cultural education. That was really important to them. They actually, in one of the assemblies, we, um, we, you know, the person who was talking kind of talked a little bit about that and then we did this dance thing. And, um, and then we also had, you know, music class and that was traditional Chinese instruments. And, but then also they focus on going into the future and what we can learn, you know, going into the future and um, about current educational things, but then also continuing to uh, respect their culture. And so I thought that that was really cool. So. Can I have a question for the students? Are any of you in the International Baccalaureate program? Okay. So how do you think that varies from the education that they were receiving? Because I've heard you say holistic, well-rounded education and character education, which is part of the IB. The IB program is similar. Um, they're Another part of their holistic training was they even had designated duties for cleaning up the classroom. And at lunches, uh, they would have food from the cafeteria served in their classroom, like it'd come in a container. And then they'd have uh, utensils to serve it, and people would go down and get it. It was like a whole community, like their whole life was together, and everything was together. Versus IB, it's very student-oriented. Like, I have the classes that I would like to go to in IB, like physics and different other classes like that. Versus everything was kind of determined by the class, and it was more of a group mentality. So did they have any choice or option in terms of what class or curricula they uh, yes. wanted to follow? They had a couple choice classes, like, um, I'm not sure exactly how much they could choose, but they could choose uh, like one AP class. They could have like psychology. And I know there was a couple other options. Like my host student, he took a class about traveling to France, which I thought was interesting. And they would learn about France. But they did have some choice on their classrooms. OK. So yeah. But not to the same extent as we do. <laughs> can, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, where your host families and those students aspire to go to college? Because when Mrs. Greif and I were there, it seemed like most of the English school students that we spoke with wanted to come to America. And they almost all wanted to go to the West Coast California schools. What did you find? Uh, well, me personally, my host student, Scott, he wanted to go to like California, Berkeley, or UCLA, USC maybe. But he was also... I, we were trying to get a lot of the students to come to the University of Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of them were interested, but they thought it might be a little too cold for them. <laughs> and a lot of them, they did want it to go, they did want to go West Coast, but they also wanted to go East Coast, a lot of Ivy League schools. So that was very, that was very common. Not very many Midwest at all. So yeah, it was mainly West and East Coast, a lot of the premier schools. Is that because you think their family 
has gone there, friends that they know, or is it more advertising based that more popular schools? Well, yeah, I just think that they obviously they're not in the same. We are in America, and we see all the all the colleges, but they just hear about oh, Harvard's the best school and things like that, and so they just aspire to go there, and their parents push them. Their parents push them to be the best that they can, and they think that a lot of them got the feel that the West Coast and East Coast schools were the best schools, and they had to go there. So they aspired to go there, and they studied to go there, and that's just what their mentality is. Obviously, you were asking a lot of questions, but I hope you got asked a lot of questions. What were some of the more insightful questions you got asked that made you think uh, about your education and things in the U.S.? Well, um, one thing that I hadn't anticipated going there is um, the majority of them have been to America multiple times. So, you know, we, we had this presentation on PowerPoint on all the culture and different things, and they've, they've been here, so they, they got the chance. They've seen a lot of it. So um, what they were really interested in was the small towns because they usually tourist or, uh, tourist places are the bigger cities. So we got to um, – they were really – one thing that a lot of them asked us is about driving because they, they don't drive there themselves, so they could not – I believe that we were driving ourselves to school, driving, you know, just to a friend's house. So that was um, a thing we were asked a lot. Um, uh, yeah, they, um, we really got the chance to share, um, because each of us are in very different um, clubs and different sports and stuff. So um, we got to show them a variety and just show them how even in this one class we are all interested in very different things. And um, so they were very, they liked that, that how much freedom, how much independence we have in getting to choose the pathway. Whereas there, um, you know, all the freshmen take cheerleading and that's, and then all the sophomores, they do a play. So um, it's very, they do the very similar things. Whereas here we get to choose our pathway kind of and choose our extracurriculars. We asked a lot about that. Thank you. Okay, now did anyone use Rosetta Stone to learn some Mandarin before? Looking to have the feedback on that. Nobody? No. They were very interested in practicing English on when we came there, and they would apologize profusely for not being able to speak English well when we knew very limited Mandarin. And so um, everywhere we went, if we were lost, I would just ask someone where we were, and they would be very eager to respond and then apologize again that they didn't speak very well. So quite honestly, it was um, the language I was <coughs> nervous about of not knowing it, but they, they just are so gracious, and how can we help you? And, and they wanted to talk to us, and we would get free desserts and restaurants because they wanted to speak English with us. And um, so that was, I would have liked to have more Mandarin um, before, or some Mandarin before going. Um, um, what else? I would like to mention the uh, classrooms as far as um, a structure that's unique there is that every, um, the teacher, there's a homeroom that all the students report to. So all 33 of these students that were in the same class, they are responsible. There's a homeroom teacher that they report to all the time. So rather than reporting to, if you have a problem with your chemistry teacher, rather than talking to the chemistry teacher, that homeroom teacher would make the communication with the family. And that was really interesting. And they called her their second mother, correct? Um, and that teacher would travel in and out of the room. But she worked with them for years, all their high school years, correct? So I thought that was very interesting. Um, you asked about the teachers, like the workload there. They were actually surprised to learn that we teach more hours than they do because of the variety of their schedules. Someday they might teach two hours, and some days they might teach five. So, um, and quite honestly, the curriculum was um, in the classrooms, like the American history, you were learning the same thing here that they were learning there, which I thought was interesting. Uh, yeah, the exact same, but yet we're not learning um, the Chinese history or the Taiwanese history. They knew an awful lot about us. Um, some of the adults we spoke to said, um, they, they, they have traveled to many more places in the United States than I have. Um, so again, they were very worldly and very global um, with all of that. Well, thank you for representing us and representing us well. Um, and I hope to give you a lot of insights for your future in addition. It was great. Th thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Not to 
do a little korean we're going to go from the yin and the yang from exciting programs to budget <laughs> so so linda we're going to morph over to you for uh for budget at this point we have no pretty pictures <laughs> But this is one of those items that we are not just recommended to do, but are required to do. And it may seem a little backwards that at this meeting we present the 2013-14 budget. And then at the next meeting we will ask you for your approval for that budget. But at the same time we will also provide for you the final budget for 2012-13. Just the, the order of doing things. Uh, we always have to amend the budget as we go, and in fact, probably within two hours of finalizing the budget and giving it to Cindy so that she could finish the board agenda, we received something from the state that changed the numbers here. Uh, doesn't change the bottom line, but changes the revenue, changes the expenditures, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So budgets are always a work in process because the information is always changing. But I'd like to begin by thanking everyone within the district who works on this. This is a huge endeavor. We are a large operation with tens of millions of dollars of revenues and expenditures. And this is not my budget. This is collectively our budget. And everyone does work with me to pull it together. All of our administrators have a hand in it, as does Carol Laux, in our business manager. And uh, another large portion of the budget is done by the Human Resources Department because they budget for all of the paraprofessionals. I budget for most of the staff in the district, but they budget for the paras. And that's a fairly complex piece because of the number of paras and the number of assignments that each para is likely to have. So I, I would like to mention them because of all the departments, they probably play a larger role than some. But here's where we are. We had the board workshop on May 13th, and I presented to you the best information that we had at the time. Some of that has continued to be accurate. Some of it was changing even as we were meeting. And some of it I was able to give you an inkling of where it appeared it was going. And as it turned out, pretty much everything that we were hearing at that time was accurate. Uh, and so the governor, the House, and the Senate all were able to get the pieces that they wanted into the budget because there was some additional revenue coming on at that time. This evening, we present the proposed budget to you, and we conclude it with a public hearing on the millage rate. There was a time in the life of school districts where that public hearing on the millage rate uh, was more than a formality because you actually had some degree of control over the size of the millage. For example, in Midland, it was pretty traditional to have a levied millage rate, but then the board would decide to levy a smaller amount than the amount that had been um, voted. But these days, that's no longer the case. Uh, the state sets our foundation allowance on the assumption that we will levy 18 mills on industrial, uh, non-residential properties six mills on commercial real property, and a hold harmless millage on everyone else, and that hold harmless millage is limited by the amount necessary to raise $415.31 per pupil. And based on the best information that I have from the county treasurer's office today, I estimate that rate to be 1.7084 mills. So we will get to that hearing at the end, but if you wondered why that's on the agenda, it's because in order to, now it's more of a formality, but in order to move forward with our budget, we do ha still have to have a public hearing on those rates. Uh, so we will not take any action until June 24th, and at that time you'll be approving two budgets, the 12-13 and the 13-14. So here is the snapshot. And I have a comparison of the 12-13 budget, and that is as it was revised in February. And then the 13-14 as we know it today, and showing the areas of change. Uh, as we discussed at the board budget workshop, I did include a section of the historical variance and broke it out by both revenue, which traditionally has a smaller variance, and by expenditures. And a major difference between 13-14 from what we looked at at the workshop is the inclusion of 
one of a, a new categorical called the MIPSERS pre-funding. This is not the MIPSERS offset that has already been a categorical, but this is a new categorical. And at the time they prepared the budget, the figure that I had from the House Fiscal Agency was about $174 per pupil. So I built that into both revenues and expenses. So there's about $1.3 million more on both sides. Friday afternoon, we received notice from the state that they've completed the calculations. That figure is going to be closer to $2.2 million for us. So that's a revision that will come along. There's also an amount of, I believe it's eight or $900,000 that has been approved as a supplemental appropriation for this year, 12-13. So that 12-13 column will have <coughs> an equivalent amount added to both revenues and expenditures when we bring it forward in two weeks. So major change there. Uh, but what you will see is that on the revenue side, revenues are down somewhat, and you really need to look at that in net. So take out 1.3 million, uh, and you'll get a sense of where the true revenues are. And on expenditures, we were able to hold it pretty flat. If we'd not had to add the increase for the MIPSERS, we would have actually come in about 1.3 million below where we are in the, the current year. So when we take into account all the anticipated variance, you may wonder why I didn't build variance into 12, 13 revenues. That's because at this point, with the exception of that MIPSERS, we have a pretty good idea of where the variance is on the revenue side. We've already accounted for the ESA prior year adjustment and some of the other changes in categorical. Uh, so revenues, I think, are pretty close to where they will be. Uh, but on the spending side, there's generally some pretty good variance at the end of the year. So you'll see. Expect to have spendable fund balance of about $10.9 million at the end of this month, which can be carried forward for next year. And then following through that same logic, I would expect to have about $7.7 .7 million on hand next year, uh, using probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $3 million, give or take, over the, the course of 13-14. Um, on paper, if you looked at the, the formal budget document, it does show a shortfall in excess of $6 million. And we are required to be upfront about that and say, if all revenues and all expenditures were just perfectly identified, that's what it would be. But knowing what our past history has been, I think this is probably a closer number, roughly $2.6 million between two and, and three. Uh, but we will be down to about 9.7% of all of our expenditures available in spendable fund balance. A little pictorial history of the last few years. I'd like to go back to 2008, 2009, because that was the last year that we were fully funded. That was the year that our per pupil foundation was $8,904. And that included almost $300 of a line item from the state called 20J that was designed to make sure that we received the same per dollar or per pupil dollar increase as other districts. And you know the story, the Governor Granholm vetoed that and then due to changes in the state economy, $470 per pupil was cut out. So 8-9 was our highest per pupil revenue in the post-proposal days of post-proposal A days for Midland Public Schools. And you can see that as a result of changes at the state as well as declining enrollment. Revenues have been declining and we have been able to reduce uh, expenditures, just not quite at the same rate. And in some cases, we have made pretty significant cuts in years but still ended up with increasing expenditures because of things external to us, such as the retirement rate that we're charged as a percent of payroll. And we may cut our payroll, but still end up having to pay more in combined pay and benefits as a result of that. But overall, we've done a lot of hard work over the last few years, and I think the chart shows it, although we continue to have the mismatch between revenues and expenditures. And we are able to do that because in times past, we had a pretty good fund balance. And you can see there were years where we increased the fund balance, 
Some years we deliberately spent it down. Uh, the 01 year where you see a big drop, that was a deliberate decision by the board to spend some money that had come in on the Durant settlement for technology. Uh, and then my predecessor, I'm sure, would love to take credit for this. Uh, this is really about the last time that MPS was able to add significant dollar amounts to the fund balance. We, we had a pretty good year there, but overall the trend has been down and has continued, but we're using the fund balance that we were able to put away when times were a little bit better. Uh, so for 13-14, here's our major assumptions. I think at the board budget workshop I mentioned that there was likely to be a change in the blended count or how we count pupils for funding purposes. That did come about. And so we ended up using a blend of 90% of this coming fall and 10% of next spring. That was what the Senate was proposing. The House was proposing an 80-20 and the current was actually 10% of the spring we we're in right now and 90% of the fall. So we're shifting forward into a period of probably more decline than when we were in the previous year. So with that, we'll be down about 183 students in the blended count. 7,914, I believe, is uh, the, the estimate. I have a chart for you later. Uh, as all of the pieces came to pass, there will be a $30 per pupil increase in the foundation. So the foundation will go from $8,141 per pupil up to $8,171 per pupil. But it's really only a net of five. And here's how we get there. We've had a categorical under Section 147A of the State School Aid Act called the MIPSERS offset. And that has been provided by the state for this is probably, th I think this would be the third year, and it's designed to help districts with the increasing cost of that payroll rate. So for this past year, it was over 900000 almost close to a million dollars that we've been receiving to help offset that rate. That is being reduced by $42 per pupil next year in order to provide the foundation increase. Now, a foundation increase benefits more districts, and the states use the 2x formula, so our increase is $30. Our surrounding districts have an increase of $60, uh, but the MIPSERS offset only has benefited those districts that have a sizable payroll. So charter schools, which contract for all their labor and don't contribute to MIPSERS, don't benefit from that MIPSERS offset. They will benefit from the foundation increase. Uh, districts that have a lot of contracted labor, not support services, <coughs> will benefit more from that than they would for the offset. But for us, that's actually a negative. Uh, so fairly late in the game was the addition of a hold harmless categorical. So we get to use the word, word hold harmless yet a third time. Not only are we a hold harmless district with a hold harmless millage, but we now have a hold harmless categorical and none of the three are connected. <laughs> Uh, and the idea of the hold harmless was to guarantee that the <coughs> net increase in the foundation and the MIPSERS offset would be at least $5 per pupil. And so 30 minus 42 plus 17, we have a net revenue increase of $5, and a good chunk of that is now coming through a categorical rather than the foundation. Uh, also, and this is truly good news for us, this will be the second year that the State School Aid Act has included a performance incentive for student performance on the MEEP test of a year ago. So this is based on the 11-12 MEEP. There's nothing we could do proactively to qualify for this. This is just a retroactive look at what the test scores were at that time. Uh, and it's $30 that you could qualify for mathematics, $30 for reading, and then $40 for a slightly different calculation for the high school MEEP in 12-13. We didn't qualify for anything from the 10-11 MEEP, but for 13-14, we do qualify for $30, and that's $30 for all pupils, not just $30 for the pupils in grades three through eight. 
Uh, and that's already been identified. We have the papers from the state that show a yes in our column for Midland Public Schools. And so I calculated $30 based on that enrollment of 7914 uh, Then at the time that I prepared this, I had information that said we would be receiving $172 per pupil for the MIPSERS health prefunding. Um, I'm not sure. The latest doesn't have a per pupil amount, but it shows uh, an amount of $2.2 million is what we'll actually receive for Section 147C, not to be confused with 147A. Uh, and then we did build into the budget $250,000 for anticipated grant funding for the International Baccalaureate Primary Years Program. And I don't know if Mr. Ellinger would like to talk any more about that. I, we've made some decisions on the staffing side as well. Just briefly to say that for right now, um, two of our three major foundations have already sent us notification that they've granted our request that you're all aware we've made to them. Um, we anticipate, perhaps as early as tomorrow afternoon, having a major joint press release between those foundations and the school where we can make, uh, we can specifically identify uh, the foundations that are involved in that. So it's very optimistic and great news for us as a school district. Before you move off the slide, can you just go yep. back? I just, it would be timely to point this out. Uh, minus the IV reference, Linda, on this slide, how would you characterize this funding? Is it ongoing? Is it something that can be depended upon, or is it one-time money? Uh, the foundation increase is ongoing. Every categorical it should be considered one time um, because the history of the development of this year's State School Aid Act, uh, depending on whose version of the budget or proposed budget you were looking at, governor, house, or senate, all of these were either significantly reduced or eliminated in one of those versions. And <clears throat> the only reason they were able to come back and come back to a level equivalent to where they are in this year was because of that good news in the revenue consensus conference that took place after our board workshop that showed there was additional money available that could then be distributed. I would describe everything, well, really even the foundation increase. I believe everything up there is someone's pet interest at either the executive or the House or the Senate level. And we were lucky that there was enough money available that everyone was able to fund their pet interest this year. That doesn't always happen. And I heard John Nixon, the state budget director, speak back in April. And his attitude was that we should view all of these things as one time. He really doesn't understand why we've built budgets around them. Uh, and so good financial management would say, since they're all one time, we would match one time expenditures to the one-time sources of revenue. Of course, most of us have not had the luxury of being able to do that. They've just gone into ongoing operations. But that's truly the view at the state level is that most of these are one-time, and certainly some that you have to qualify for, like the performance incentive. Um, there's not a lot that, that we can do other than to attempt to maintain high performance. Thanks for doing that. I think that's really important for our community and people in the audience to understand because you look at the difference between where we think we're going to be with our fund equity this year and what we anticipate it being next year, and it dropped from 13.7 down to 9.7. That means there are expenditures built into the budget that if we don't change that, going into the following, following year, theoretically, unless all this shows up again as revenue, you could see another equal drop of almost 4%. That is a dangerous place to get a budget when you're looking at, uh, you know, four or five percent fund equity. Just a picture of what it looks like because while there was good news there about some of the additional money, really the overall effect, if you ignore the one very tall bar, which is that MIPSERS prefunding, uh, almost everything else is down from this current year. Of course, the largest bar below the line is the foundation revenue, and that's a result of declining enrollment. Uh, best practices money has been maintained at the same level, but uh, because it's tied to enrollment, it's got, I have just a tiny drop there. 
because it will be times the number of pupils and a, a little bit lower. Tech infrastructure ended up being funded at this year's level. So I would expect that to be, we received 81,000 this year, probably 7,900. Uh, there's that little bit of hold harmless money. Uh, the MIPSERS offset is going to be reduced about $300,000. But then the MIPSERS prefunding at the time I made the chart was at 1.3, 1.4 million. You can actually take that bar even higher. Uh, but unfortunately, it can't be used for anything other than the bill that they're going to send us immediately after they send us the money each month. Uh, Medicaid reimbursement, this flows through from the Midland County Education Service Agency. And our current year budget included uh, an expected one-time payment of uh, some prior year adjustments that the ESA was working on getting for the local districts. Uh, if that's received this year, certainly we can't expect it again next year, so it's out. We also had mid-year adjusted about $600,000 added back into the budget for the ESA's prior year adjustments on the distribution of the Act 18 millage as well as the expenses. Uh, we've had a couple of shared staff that those arrangements are ending. I do anticipate that the Act 18 millage and the enhancement millage will be a little bit larger. The Act 18 millage comes from the figures that the ESA presented. Uh, I'm not sure they were obvious in the budget presentation that they gave to the board, but they gave me some backup materials that had our specific Act 18 millage distribution and tuition costs. Uh, the enhancement millage is my estimate based on what's happened with taxable values. MPS TV will be down a little bit because of an issue that we see on the agenda coming up. We had a one-time gift to update some of our very old equipment. Uh, and then federal program money, we expect that to be reduced, and we've reduced expenses to match. Uh, so there's the enrollment picture, uh, 7,914 with out of the blended count. And I wouldn't expect you to remember the numbers back from the budget workshop, but certainly the governor's budget gave us the most optimistic blended count because it was 10% of the spring that we've just completed and 90% of the fall. Uh, the house was the, the poorest for us, but they were all within probably 20 or 30. So blended count, 7,914. And that's a drop of almost 12% from 2008-2009. So in addition to having the highest revenue in 8-9, we also had a significantly larger enrollment. So those two combined have led to our reduction. Uh, just to repeat, this is a chart that we used at the board budget workshop. The only change is that I plugged in the number now that we know it from what the blended count will actually be. I think I was using the governor's figure at that time. Uh, so continued downward trend. And you can see our, our peak in recent years was about a decade ago. Here's how it breaks out. And this is an interesting I think it's an interesting picture uh, because it shows the role that state funding now plays in Midland Public Schools. Again, going back to 2008-9, our foundation, $8,904. We had our hold harmless millage. We had our local millage. And about 26.7% of that was local. And we also had the state aid payment and the state 20J. So if you added the local millage, the hold harmless, the state aid, and the 20J, you reach that 8,904. And now we're down to 8,171. And you may wonder, why does the percent from the state vary? It's dependent on taxable value. The state assumes that we're going to levy the millage rates that I began the presentation with, and then they build their payment off of that. So if we chose not to levy any one of those, you could reduce that top number by whatever the effect would be on the local millage. The state does not make that up. Nor do you have the flexibility to decide that you want your millage rates to be higher. These are now statutorily determined rates that require voter approval every few years. Uh, but you may not ask your voters to approve beyond the 18, the 6, and the amount required for the hold harmless. Uh, and if we go back. Prior to Proposal A, 
the number at the bottom of that chart percent of funding would have been minuscule. Possibly not even 1%. We were primarily a locally funded district. And here's what's happened because the foundation is determined by the state. You can see I've compared our foundation to what the state calls the minimum foundation per pupil and shown the percentage increases. Now I've thought about, I think maybe next year I may change it to show you the actual dollar increases because for probably the last four or five years, if there has been an increase, the state has used what they call the 2x formula or half x if you're Midland Public Schools. We get half the increase of the surrounding districts because the intent is to raise the minimum foundation and to narrow the gap between the higher funded districts and the lower funded districts. So you can see that on a percentage basis, in most years, the surrounding districts get a much higher percent increase than we do. And in the last few years, they also receive a much higher actual dollar increase than we do. Uh, and certainly not included in any of this are the equity payments that the other districts have received too. So rather than increasing the foundation, which does perpetuate, other districts for the last few years have received one-time categorical payments called equity payments that help reduce the gap in that particular year, but the amount doesn't carry forward. So for them, it's another one-time source of money, but it does narrow the gap more than perhaps this would indicate. Uh, interesting just to see uh, the orange is what the percent change of our foundation has been. And you can see we had a couple of years of really sizable drops. Now this is not at all connected to enrollment. This is just the foundation as voted by the Michigan legislature and approved by the governor. Uh, and the blue line is what CPI has been during that time period. So certainly no question of our foundation getting anywhere close to uh, CPI. CPI, I think, was over 22% if you totaled it during that time period. Our foundation has increased maybe 3% over that same time period. So here's the revenue picture. About two-thirds of it comes from various state forces state sources, not necessarily just the foundation, but all the categoricals that I, I showed you earlier. Uh, our local property tax, which is part of the foundation, 22.5%. We do have other local revenue, and uh, as included in other local revenue would be the cell tower leases that we have. Uh, some of the Medicaid reimbursement is considered local revenue, gifts, funds from athletics, all of that is in that little sliver of other local revenue. Federal traditionally has been less than 2% <coughs> of our budget and continues to be that case. And then transfers, kind of a funny governmental accounting term, but transfers are payments from one unit of government to another. So there can be transfers in or transfers out. Our revenue are transfers in, and the largest components of that are our enhancement millage, at about 3.3 million, and the Act 18 millage. Both of those are in that category of transfers. And you can see, uh, combined, they make a pretty good chunk out of all of our revenues. So let's go to the expense side. Our major assumptions here will be no salary or wage scale changes. Although there is potential for an MCEA reduction based on the formula in the contract, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, steps and merit increases will go forward. The furlough days that teachers took this year will be eliminated, so next year they will be paid for 186 rather than 183 days. Uh, and when staffing was all said and done, we're down 3.7 teaching FTE. And that is net of a few additions, two teachers at elementary, two teachers for international baccalaureate primaries years coordinators, and that's pending the funding that we built in on the revenue side. Uh, one and a half elementary special ed and 0.8 for special services, and that ends up being 
uh, speech and school psychologist. Uh, then a few more FTE changes. We will be down two in administration, and that is net of the addition for a special education administrator. Uh, you may wonder how we get there. We have the two administrators at Central Middle School, so the closure of Central it really accounts for what you see here on this page. Uh, we've also decided that in the short run, it doesn't make sense to fill Mr. Cooper's curriculum, um, our coordinator of mathematics position on a permanent basis, so that's going to be filled part-time by a teacher consultant. Um, so that reduces the administrative headcount and FTE count. And then we have a special education administrator on top of it. So down three, up one, net two. Uh, and then we also have a building manager and administrative assistant that's reduced because of the closure of Central. And based on our most recent payments totaled to Connect Care over the last however many weeks it is, as of last Wednesday, uh, made the decision that for all of our health-related benefits, dental, medical, and vision, uh, the appropriate reduction was 6.9% from the total that was budgeted this year. That's not, I'm not saying there will be a 6.9% reduction in our medical costs, but from the total of all of those that was budgeted, and I, I have a slide at the end where I'll talk a little bit more about the, the medical costs. Uh, on the staff side, this is what it looks like. The bottom blue line, the light line, is the students per administrator. And you can see that over the years, we've increased the number, uh, had some drops, and now we're back up to between 22 and, or 200, it's really about 225 students <coughs> for every administrator. Uh, then certificated staff, the line in the middle combines teachers and administrators because we are all certificated uh, holding <coughs> teaching certificates. And then the students per teacher, top line, you can see, and you want to use the left-hand axis, uh, was 16, about a dozen, a little more than a dozen years ago, per students per teacher, and now it's up to about 17 on average. And when I use the word teacher here, I'm referring to the entire membership of the MCEA. So that does include some of the ancillary staff. These are not just classroom teachers. Now I'm going to pull together some of the specifics on the salaries and the benefits because that's about 85% of the entire budget. <clears throat> this is really where the action is. And a later agenda item is the approval of the salary letter. And so I thought I would just bring in together in some of the details from that here because it, these are the assumptions that drive the budget. Uh, we, as a reminder, we have three groups of unionized employees. We have the Midland City Education Support Personnel Association representing grounds and maintenance. Their contract expired at the end of September. We reached a tentative agreement with them last week on Tuesday, June 3rd, and I believe you will be hearing more about that later at this meeting. Uh, the MCEA, representing <coughs> the teachers and the electronic learning facilita facilitators, negotiations are complete for another two years. So that was a very easy thing to estimate. Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals, same thing. So we had two completed contracts that went into the preparation of the budget, and we had Masespa that was underway as I was finishing up the details. So I was able to incorporate any changes that were in that contract uh, in, into the budget for next year. And then we have all of the unaffiliated or non-union employees, and these are all represented in the salary letter as well. Some of them are on a system of steps that looks similar to the teacher scale, and then some, like administrators and managers, are on a merit-based system, goes back to the old Hay system developed in the district in 1968. And so while there is a scale movement along that scale, it is not step-based, it's not time-related, uh, but it is based on merit and performance. And once employees reach the top of whatever the salary scale is for their area, then they're maxed out. 
unless the range changes. Uh, so here's what we would expect. Salary and wage scales stay where they are. And that does include the concessions that have been made in previous years. And I'll show you more about that in a minute. For budget purposes, I did not change the MCA salary schedule other than to add back the three furlough days. Uh, the contract does contain a formula that would provide an adjustment ranging from negative 2% to 0% that's pending the outcome of the audit. So using what I knew right now, I w estimated that it's not likely that there's going to be a change to the scale, but it does remain a possibility. Uh, if there is, it'll be a very small number, but we will not know this until probably sometime in August would be the earliest that we would know what the adjustment's going to be. Uh, and then the reason I use where permitted by law is if we had a contract that was not settled, those employees would not be legally permitted to receive their step increase. But because pending your vote this evening on the Macespa contract, all employees, I would expect, will receive their merit-based or their negotiated increases that move them along. So these are what the wage or salary changes have looked like for our five largest employee groups. Not all of the one groups that I showed you on listed on the, one of the earlier slides, but these are our five largest groups. And what I want to point out is what's missing here. Because these total increases really don't tell the complete story for any one of these employee groups. In every case, if you look at the bottom and say, well, office professionals and managers, uh, they've had a, seen a 2.8% increase from 0506 through 1314. That's not entirely true when you know about some of the other concessions that have taken place. Same thing for teachers, administrators, and paraprofessionals. First, every one of these groups is, in is engaged in contributing toward the cost of their health insurance. And that percentage varies. I'll show you a chart in a minute by the employee group. But every single one up there is contributing, if they're receiving health care, an amount that could be as high as 6.5%, I believe, of their total salary. Uh, I take <coughs> that back, 7.8% for some employee groups. Uh, the lowest contribution would be three quarters of a percent of their salary. And the highest, depending on which group they're in, could be 7.8%. Uh, we've also had, over this same time period, administrators at one time received a stipend that was meant to cover the cost of their travel within the district and the cell phone that we ask everyone to have. And that was eliminated a couple of years ago because that was a way of reducing overall compensation for that group by about 1%. Uh, also lost in this past year were a number of what I would call contract enhancements in the contract with the MCEA. These were not amounts that everyone enjoyed, but people in particular groups may have received a stipend for a particular activity. When I say activity, I don't mean an extracurricular activity, but if they traveled between buildings for their teaching assignment, they received a daily stipend for that. A number of those went away in the last contract settlement. And again, they would not show up here because these are the things that affect every member of the group, whereas some of these others only affect select members. Uh, and then also, we are, I believe, in the third year now of we implemented what we call the Tier 2 wage schedule for administrators. And you see that outlined in the salary letter. And that was a way of reducing ongoing administrative costs. And we are now going into the 13-14 year at a point where slightly more than half of the entire administrative ranks are on that second schedule already. And the savings per, per position are about a 4 to 5 percent reduction in pay on each of those. And that's the only group that has a second wage scale that people go to if they move into a new position or if they're newly hired in the district. So all, none of those pieces are reflected here. And I would 
be willing to say, as, and for the teachers, the furlough days are also not shown as a reduction in their overall wages because it didn't change the scale. But I would be willing to say that for every group up there, probably the comparison back to the five, six would be a negative percentage. Other features in the salary letter are to pay a stipend of $250 to each administrator and $150 to each teacher with a highly effective rating. We are required by law to have some sort of a merit component. And uh, this will be the second year. That's, this is not new, but this is the, just one of the features in the salary letter that I wanted you to be aware of. Talk about the reason for the differential between teachers and administrator. Remember length of service of year. Uh, yeah, it's length of uh, contract. contract. Yeah. Teachers typically have a 10-month, administrators have 11 or 12, and teachers have a 7-hour day, and administrators have an 8-hour day. So uh, that's why the number wasn't the same. Uh, we've also broken down the pay for athletic event workers into three categories, and that more accurately reflects what was going on. Uh, there was already a recognition that when someone worked an athletic event that was an all-day Saturday event, the pay for that probably should not be the same as a simple after-school event. And so you'll see that reflected in there. Uh, and then we also reintroduced a step schedule for substitute bus drivers. And substitute bus drivers are not substitutes in the sense that teachers are. Our substitute bus drivers are MPS employees because they need to have particular certifications and licenses, and they have to know the runs, the routes. Uh, so we employ eight to 10 people, none of them on a full-time basis, but they all work as substitutes. And we had tried to do away with a step schedule. At one time, they were on the same schedule as all bus drivers. And we've reinstituted a, a modified lower schedule in an attempt to try to keep people because we're finding that we're, we're losing our substitute bus drivers and uh, we really don't want to be in a position of telling parents we couldn't pick up their children today because we didn't have anyone to drive the bus. Uh, then we also will be paying more for uh, retirement and there are now 14 different rates. Payroll is a gem. <laughs> Our payroll people are, they stay on top of this, but schools have to have one of the most complex payrolls because of the retirement reporting of anyone that I, I can think of. We have gone from what was a fairly simple one or two or maybe four rates to now 14 different rates. And they range from 20.96% to 26.96% of payroll. And the rates next year will go up anywhere. You'll, you'll see the 24.32 up to 24.79. And at the time I did this, I said that the amount that we paid would actually be about 3% higher, offset by that categorical. It's looking like that amount is actually going to be about 5% higher. I built into the budget a payment of 27.79% and based on what I received Friday, I need to, when I do the modification, take that up to 29%. Uh, but the good news there is it does come with offsetting revenue. So unlike a lot of years when I would be telling you that our costs are going up $2 million because of retirement, even after we cut $3 million out, uh, that's not the case here. The state has made good on their promise of keeping the, the rates for the districts at a, a lower level. So on the premium sharing side, this is what it looks like. Administrators and teachers follow the same schedule of contribution of anywhere from 1.75% up to 3%, depending on their level of coverage. Building managers stand out. That was done in lieu of reducing them to 11 months, which was the conversation a few years ago. Uh, very, very large contribution for those who have family coverage. Uh, I will say under the Affordable Health Care Act, we are still within what would be considered an affordable plan for those employees because the single coverage does not exceed 9% of 
their income, but it does stand out when you look at all of our other employees. But that, that was the, their proposal to us at the time when we were talking about reducing them from a 12 to an 11 month contract, that really made up the difference. Uh, and at the same time they did that, they took a 2.5% wage cut. Uh, members of MSESPA and the Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals and all of our other unaffiliates all contribute at the a rate that we originally set when we moved into this a few years ago, three quarters of a percent of their income if they have single coverage, up to 2% per family. And I will say that we are within the state required hard cap and our figures also keep us good for the Affordable Health Care Act. We are not worried about any penalties because of unaffordability or the 10% state aid penalty because we are paying more than the hard cap. So it's working for us. So premium sharing in aggregates covers about 17% of the more than 6 million cost of all of our health benefits. It's probably closer to seven if we add in uh, dental and vision. And because it's based on a percent of wages, we don't have employees who are all paying the same percent of their share. Typical administrator pays about 21% of the cost of their coverage, typical teacher about 12, and a typical para of about two. And we find that to be perfectly acceptable because of the differences in the wage rates with all of those groups. We, we feel that this is a fairer way to go. And as I mentioned, we don't have worries about unaffordability under federal law. So other major expenditure assumptions. We did have to build the technology spending back in because of the loss of the bond election. And we increased technology professional development costs by 15,000. We did see an increase as estimated by the MCESA for our special education tuition, which if you're looking at the budget is a transfer out in the special education category. Uh, but we also have increased the Act 18 revenue. So we actually ended up about $40,000 better next year than we are in the current year. We did reduce uh, estimated cost of utilities to reflect conservation efforts and some purchasing changes that we made. We reduced the bus purchases to five and as I mentioned, adjusted all of the retirement accounts up to what I thought at the time was the appropriate level for that Mipser's pre-funding. Here's how the major categories break down. With all of that taken into account, all of the teachers now stepping and the furlough day is gone. Uh, we really have done remarkably well on the salary side. You can see the salaries really only increased 300000 which I think we can attribute to some of the hard work that we've done with contracts over the past few years. We had a reasonable number of retirements, and we've not needed to replace all of them. So our net salary cost, uh, including the reduction of administrators, building manager, administrative assistant, really very minimal increase there. Benefits, if I'd not had to increase the MIPSERS for the pre-funding, would have declined. And then all of the other categories, uh, until we get down to the bottom two, are reduced. And remember what I said about the ESA tuition, that's that outgoing transfer. That's why that number is up. So overall, from the February budget, $88,000 difference, which in our world, I would say that's a flat budget. And this is what it looks like by function. Pretty close to 65% in classroom instruction. And then when you add the 5.4% for student support, you can see 70% of our budget is going directly to students and into those categories that affect them most closely. Uh, then instructional support, that in also includes a lot of teachers whose role it is to support other teachers. We have over the years, as we've reduced staffing back in the curriculum division and the department chairs, particularly the department chairs at the high school level, 
we have shifted to a system of teacher leaders and teacher consultants. And so we now have sort of hidden in that category of instructional support a fair number of teachers. I can't remember the FTE, but it is hundreds of thousands of dollars for teachers who are serving in those consulting roles where they are working with their peers on improving classroom instruction. So it's a, a number that if you look at over time, you may wonder why has that category changed, but it's because we have shifted the way we're doing things and you would see a decline in building administration, but a shift toward instructional support as we're taking, making use of the expertise of the teachers. Linda, let me editorialize just for a brief moment on that point because as the budget gets even tighter in the next couple of years here, <coughs> there may be an inclination on the part of the board to say, well, do we really need to do that? Or what if we put those teachers back into classrooms and lowered class size? I would hope you would be very careful in automatically making that decision because there's a lot of research that says if you have teachers that have colleagues that used to be teachers as recently as a year ago, and you put them in a position to be resources for teachers still teaching directly with children, there's huge payoff for that um, with how kids do academically. So it's a model that works really well here and our teachers depend upon it. And we've got some outstanding teacher consultants and teacher leaders. I think they're well respected by their peers. They do great work. I do not want to imply that they are somehow overpriced. I just want you to know how many that we have and how we have shifted how we've operated over the years with a movement away from the building level administrators to the teacher support people within their own departments. Uh, we always look at the budget two ways. The one is by the function, and then the other is what does the money get us? And you can see that other than that tan section of 15.2%, our entire budget is spent on people. So not quite 85, 84.8% of the budget is for people, 57% of that is for their salaries, FICA relatively small, retirement is now 15.5% of the budget, uh, medical 6.4, there was a time in the not all that distant past where medical and retirement were about the same percentage. I think they both may have been about 8% of the budget and no longer the case. Uh, and then everything else we do, that tan section of other is 15.2%. And in that area are all of our utilities, and that accounts for about 1.6 million. Um, any of our capital, so any purchases of technology are in there. And that big bottom one, the outgoing transfers, again, those are payments for tuition to the ESA for, for the most part. So a couple of things to keep in mind as we look forward uh, to next year. So these are just the areas of what I would say are problematic, at least, uh, to consider for next year. There are additional changes to pupil counting that create uncertainty about that blended count. Not only did we move to the spring, so now I know I have only forecasts to work off of from the fall and the spring, but the state has put in place a mechanism to allow money to follow students between those two count days. It creates tremendous uncertainty. And then also the volatility of our health plan claims increases the uncertainty of forecasting from the current costs, which is how I always move forward. And I'll, I'll give you more details on both of these. New section of the State School Aid Act, Section 25E, directs CEPI, that's the Center for Educational Performance Information, uh, to work with the M Michigan Department of Ed, school districts, and intermediate school districts to develop a pupil transfer application model no later than November 1st, 2013. So, state school aid says there is going to be this system for adjusting enrollment for pupils who move. We just don't know what it is yet. We won't know what it is until after November 1st. What we do know is that the law says if a pupil transfers from a district or an intermediate school district to another one, not from out of state, but from one district to another where they were counted on the count day, 
then that will be reported and the membership, that's our blended count, will be adjusted for the number of days that they were here or were there by one 180th of the foundation allowance for that time. So any student who leaves or enters our district between October and February, there will be money following them one way or another if they came or went to another school district in Michigan. So if they came from out of state, if they came from a parochial, that doesn't matter, no money. But if they came, let's say they were at Bullet Creek and they moved to Midland or vice versa, now instead of knowing what they were on count day and being able to calculate what our blended count is, we will not know until after that second count day what our actual membership is going to be. So I haven't decided yet what that's going to mean for the timing of the mid-year budget adjustment. In the past, we have known by the time we got to the mid-year budget adjustment what our blended count was and what our funding was going to be. We will not know that in February. We are not likely to know that probably until March, possibly April. So another kind of clarification question on that? Yes. If we have students come in from out of state, out of state, say that carefully, or out of mm -hmm. country, um, I assume it has no impact until the next year if they're still here? Uh, the, it depends on if they come in before, they will be counted in February. So they will be part of our 10% February the count. But if, let's say they came in at the end of October, w they don't count for us until they get to that February count. Whereas but they if, don't now either, right? Correct. Correct, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well now if they came after the count day, they don't count at all. Uh, th but this is a step closer to the money following the pupil. And if they leave for out of state or out of country, same? We get to keep the money. Okay. okay. So I was trying to understand what the in outs were. Then. Yeah. Uh, and so here's the language on the adjustment. We won't know until sometime in second semester what our actual enrollment is going to be. So that does create a, a higher degree of uncertainty. I, then I typically present you with uh, certainly fall enrollment is always an estimate, but usually we know what at least the 10% figure is in the spring, and we don't have to worry about this. Now the state's estimates are that only about 2% of the students statewide move around. We've not done this, so I'm not sure what our history will be. We when we've looked at it, we have hundreds of students who move in and out of the district between count day. The net effect for us may only be a change of 80 or 90 students, but to get to that 80 or 90, we've literally had hundreds of students coming and going throughout that entire time period. Uh, I don't know how many of them are coming from other districts and how many are coming from out of state. Uh, what This does create an issue, though, for the juvenile care center because they've always been able to count on the membership for the pupils who were there in, at the first count day. And this may uh, require thinking a little bit differently about that. Uh, then on the medical side, kind of a busy chart, but I think it's worth understanding. We meet monthly with representatives from Connect Care and review our financial performance. And so this is from the April report. And they show us uh, what our medical and pharmacy PMPM means per <coughs> member per month by fiscal year. And so this is the annualized expectation for 2013. And I just want you to note the volatility there. And also the relative growth in the pharmacy area. When you compare the growth in pharmacy to the cost in medical, that is becoming a larger and larger component of our total expenses. And for budget purposes, I look at not the per member per month, but the per employee per month figure from Connect Care, as well as the figure that I'm generating, because you can see this is lagged. I'm able to calculate it on a week by week basis and I apply the trends that they tell us for medical and pharmacy, and they have different growth trends. 
Well, in this current year, pharmacy is now about 20% of all of our expenses. And pharmacy also has a higher growth trend than medical. Uh, but that said, you can see that in this current year, we're on target to do better than we did last year. Uh, and last year was somewhat more expensive than the year before. You can go back to the 2009 fiscal year. That was a high for us, and you can see how much higher it was than the previous year. I think that was a year we had to uh, add to the budget. Either that or 2006, you can see, was also a huge jump for us. And typically, large years are associated with something catastrophic that has happened to at least one, if not multiple, covered people uh, within the plan. Uh, because utilization certainly drives cost. Although in the pharmacy area, what is driving the cost are the cost of um, genetically created or, or biologically created drugs. And we, one of the things we do is re we review what the costs are of the mo t 10 most expensive drugs that we are paying for in our plan. And we are now paying for drugs that have costs, monthly costs that in four digits. And we're seeing more and more of those, 2,000, 4,000. And they always warn us that there are drugs that can run into in excess of $100,000 per year. So pharmacy is the area where we're growing. But I just wanted you to see this because it is an area where past performance does not necessarily indicate the future. And so when you look at the budget and look at the section on fund balance, you will see a line item designated for 10% of the uh, estimated medical budget, this would be why. We set aside that portion of the fund balance in case something would happen. Because as I mentioned, I'm forecasting lower next year because we'll have, a year. we're working off of a smaller number this year than we did last year. Uh, but there's certainly no guarantee that that will be the case. So the two areas to be concerned about for next year will be the blended count and what happens with medical. Everything else I feel like is probably will fall within the ranges that it has in previous years. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions. And I will remind you that when at the conclusion of this, we need to have Mr. Ellinger conduct the truth and budget hearing. Questions for Linda. Really? We've got a couple. Oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. Um, and this is more of a, probably a theoretical question, but just looking out into the future a little bit, Linda. With the state mandating hard caps on the amount of insurance coverage and Obamacare mandating certain affordabilities, is there a collision coming between those two in the next <laughs> couple of years? That's going to be interesting to watch. Because the state mandates a hard cap, adjust the hard cap annually uh, by a medical CPI, but the state also gives local boards the option of with the, you know, as, as long as they are able to negotiate it, an 80-20 split. I'm more concerned, if we had gone with the 80-20, I'd be more concerned that those two things would bump up against each other. I think the state hard caps are, well, the, the question will be, where is that hard cap relative to the affordability, and is it too low? I'm not sure. We'll have is, to see where those go. Is there any discussion at the state about that, I'll call it threat, or, because that puts us in a, we, I, you can't win. Yeah. I mean, I, you, who are you going to disobey if that happens? I, I don't know. This is all, this was given to the Dep Michigan Department of Treasury in order to uh, enact all the rules and regulations around it. I think they are aware of it. I'm not sure that they know what, okay. how, how it will play out. But I, I do believe that Treasury has probably given it some thought. But any change will require going back to the legislature. Change and changing either the nature of the hard cap or changing the percent. Honestly, that's why we feel good about the fact that we don't have a required 20% because for some of our lower paid employees, 20% of the cost of their health plan because they don't work a lot of hours 
could very easily exceed that 9% of their income, and then we would be in a penalty situation. There are superintendents around the state that are discussing that right now that chose the 80-20. And Linda's mm -hmm. dead on with that. They're concerned about it. They can see it coming. Yeah. We're yeah. fortuitous. Yeah. And thanks to higher employees subsidizing the lower employees. Yeah. I, I think in our case, while well, we stay with the hard cap, <coughs> and because of our good plan history, our our illustrative rates are this year, with one exception, still below the hard cap. Uh, and then we have employee contributions on top of that. So <coughs> I'm not too concerned about MPS at this time, but it's out there. And then secondly, um, I saw Judge's <coughs> opposition, just looking for, the, I think I know the source of the, of the conflict I saw in the numbers. Um, while overall salary spending next year is up, the 300 and some mm. thousand dollars with slightly fewer FTEs, yet we talked about in aggregate uh, salaries going down or being mm. flat. Mm -hmm. There's something, a disconnect there in my mind. I'm assuming that disconnect is steps. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Fair enough. That's why I yeah. want to make sure I understood the disconnect. Yeah. Yeah, depending on the, the group, um, teachers are the largest group. Who receive steps and steps in just salary terms not the related payroll charges on top of that can be in the neighborhood of half a million dollars and then the other component this year is the return of the three days every day for a teacher amounts to about a half percent and so that was an addition of a percent and a half to the scale and I think that's why I felt like we really had done well in the other areas that we were only up 300,000 whereas if you were to add all those pieces together you would have expected a much larger increase. And how many teachers did you say you were adding? Was it two at the elementary level? Uh, yes uh, and one and a half for special education. That's what it was. Yeah. Well, and then we're adding two for the primary years program as well. But yeah. at the classroom level, it was uh, two classroom elementary teachers and one and a half special ed elementary teachers. And that's it across the district. And uh, across the district, we're actually down 3.7 FTE in the, the teaching ranks. Has everybody looked at these sheets showing what our class sizes are across the district? Well, I think we're also down students next Correct. year, too. Yeah. 100. Have you looked at this, Scott? No. Because the red shows. Can you pass that down to him, please? It shows the FTEs. Like Central has a 12.7 FTE, which is probably reasonable. But Jefferson has a 30.7 FTE. Northeast has a 32.5 FTE. Dow High has a 54.2 FTE, and Midland High has a 60.4 FTE. Can you pass it to Scott, please? So what do you think that number means, Kim, at Dow, when you see 54.2 FTE? Talk to me about what you understand that to represent, would you? Well, I don't expect it to be that class size is 60, but that they are overly large and that it's not um, aligned with the Gagi studies. Yeah. I'm not sure I agree with all that. That's why I was trying to understand at a deeper level. So, uh, well, I have the actual class sizes. Well, the statistical numbers here, not the actual class sizes. But, yeah, there's some pockets that are completely out of line, and especially in our kindergarten classes. And we have 300 kids busing out of Midland Public Schools, and I think this it's attributed directly to class sizes because we know two factors are very important for kids learning in it. The, great teachers, which we have, in class sizes, so. Yeah, and, and most of the, most, well, let me just complete the statement. Okay. Most of the research on class size, and I've heard this explained to you when we had the experts from the Michigan Association of School Boards up here on a Saturday morning, would tell you unless you can reduce that ratio down to certainly less than 20, some people will tell you 16 or 17 per teacher, it has no impact on achievement. And there's long-term studies that drive that. And at our board workshop, we talked about using some numbers that you had proposed um, as class sizes. Yeah, Bloomfield Hills uses. And yeah. that would add two and a half million dollars to the budget. So if in one year your fund equity drops from 13.7 to 9.7, 
how in the world can we entertain taking on another two and a half million dollars when that would leave us in a position two years from now on not being able to balance a budget on paper? Which is I mean, why these I are just, well, hang on just a minute. These, these are just choices right. that people that sat on this board before you were elected here mm -hmm. had to make some really tough choices with. And they understand the implications about what that means for the budget so we don't go bankrupt in two years. Right. And it's easy for one board member to stand up here and talk about let's lower class size. But where are you going to find that two and a half million elsewhere in the budget? And that's, that's why I question. also suggested that we hire a consultant, which unfortunately we were Cost told money. that we weren't, it was a conflict of interest to hire a, a consultant, which is not true. Let's vet this right now. Yes, that would be great. Go ahead. Tell, well, Linda, could you please tell us why you told us that? Well, let, let's yeah, let's do this right now there because you had claimed that a consultant couldn't was a conflict of interest if they come in. And what you don't know is after you raised this at a previous board meeting, mm -hmm. Linda and I had a conference call with the, Dave Youngstrom. Right. He says he's not ever talked to you about it. No, he has What hasn't. he tell, what you claim that you did talk no, to him. No, I talked to the president. No, but you claim that you I talked, talked to, to Dave president. Youngstrum. That no, was I in didn't. an email. I have it in writing if I have to prove I it. I talked to the president of Yo and Yo, all of the. Yeah, he indicated that with someone that you used to work with, that you had talked to that person and they came to Dave. And they actually uh, took the time to review the video of that board meeting. And what Dave and this other fellow that you talked to called and told Linda and I in a conference mm -hmm. call is that the advice that Linda offered at that board meeting was dead on 100% accurate. That it was a conflict of interest for us to have a consultant no, from see, Yo and Yo the or achieve the ASBO meritorious That's board. the part of the understanding that, that I think you are misunderstanding here. Okay. You are claiming that it's a conflict of interest for them to come in and work with us. We've I'm, never not, I'm not saying that. Linda said no, there I was a telephone right. call that she that. said there was a conflict of interest as I wanted to vote right. for. And there is a conflict of, hang on, okay. what they explained to us on the telephone after viewing that board meeting is that it would be a conflict of interest for them to come in and give us advice on budget development. It would not be a conflict of interest if they worked with us toward the meritorious award. Is that correct, Mrs. Klein? Uh, not on the, the budget award. And the conflict of interest is with the specific auditor. The, aud the auditor and those working with him are not permitted to consult with us on our on budget. The budget development. Right. That's right. right. But it. So uh, you could receive the ASBO meritorious award. That would not be a conflict of interest. No, we never said it was oh. a conflict of interest. Yes, you did. No, what we said was it was a conflict of interest. It's the same misunderstanding we're having right now. It's a conflict of interest to have that auditor work with us on budget development. That's what we said was a conflict of interest. That's what Linda said at that meeting, and it's what Dave Youngstrom and the fellow you talked with told no. us was accurate. And if I may chime in, an award does nothing to solve the budget problem. No. Well, it does, it does help highlight. FFO, FFO studied it, looked at the money, said, what do we get out of it? FFO reported back, recommending not going that direction. Correct. And that's where we left it. Well, that's more and what it was about, not that there was a conflict of interest with Dave Youngstrom helping us. And there are lots of... That was of other detail behind yes. it. But the decision was made not to go for the meritorious award because it doesn't solve a thing about too much revenues, not enough cost, and only costs us more money to go get it. Well, and, and the bottom so, line for me, Mr. President, is that there's not a shred of evidence that in recent years here, and frankly in the history of this district, that we haven't had anything but great internal financial advice coming out of that office. Yeah. And to have someone join the board without understanding what it is we do and the processes we follow and suggest otherwise, on multiple occasions, in email after email after email, rubs me a little thin, to tell you the truth. Well, and that we had five superintendents that we interviewed, and they were all solving their budget problems and being very creative about it. Okay. Point of order. Okay. We're going to go back to what the budget is and go back to the point of the question. The question is, do we open the public hearing on the border? Are there any other questions concerning the facts of the budget? Oh, one. wait, I had one more point, too. As far as the consulting goes, perhaps we couldn't work with Dave Youngstrom, but there's a lot of experts at Yo and Yo. And Mike Sharrow has also worked with Plant Moran, so that might be a great opportunity to have fresh I, eyes. I look could at answer budget. that FFO has looked at that already, okay. uh, but maybe we'll look at it again. But that recommendation was strong and studied, so I'll leave that question.
question where it is. It's a regurgitation of the same question. So with that, we'll move on to the next agenda item of a public hearing for, for the budget, unless there are other questions pertaining to the facts of the budget. None. We'll go to the to go to the hearing. Uh, you can put the screen up, uh, Cindy, just in case. Um, we, it's just to declare a public hearing to have feedback from the audience uh, on Linda's presentation. Um, if someone would like to step up and do that, um, you're more than welcome to do so. I would tell you that in my six years of being superintendent here, the thoroughness with which Mrs. Klein reviewed the budget tonight was the most thorough and deliberate I've ever seen you do, and it's hard not to be impressed by that. So. Sometimes we talk about how busy we are this time of year with closing down this year's budget and preparing for the next school year. And I think there are times Linda wishes she could go in her office and lock her door <laughs> so she could work on interrupted wise for about three weeks to prepare for this. And at the minimum amount of time, you've done an outstanding job with it. I want to thank you. And I would like to add that at the hearing, you specifically have to request whether there is any feedback on the proposed millage rates of 18 mills on non-homestead property, six mills on commercial real property, and 1.7084 mills on principal residence, qualified agricultural, qualified forest, industrial personal, and commercial personal property. That is the estimated rate today uh, when the final taxable values have been determined and posted by the county treasurer's office, which typically happens late August, beginning of September, I will bring to you an official resolution uh, with the rate determined at that time. But our estimate right now is 1.7084. And you are required to ask whether there's any public feedback on any of those rates. That being said, is there any public feedback on our millage rates? none I guess the hearing would be closed there you go Hearing closed and Carl will we do another hearing next week um, as part of this I mean typically we, we don't do a hearing but there's an opportunity for audience to visitors yeah. for the community to comment on the to budget. comment on the budget and I welcome anybody Not to next do so. week but the next, the next week. week yeah okay from there we'll move into item 4.4 uh, boardroom audio video renovation yes. and, uh, and we didn't put this under the consent agenda because uh, really this is regarding your own space. Uh, but as a bit of history, we have worked collaboratively with the city for a number of years on our component of the local educational and governmental programming. And they have supported us each year with an amount that helps offset some of the cost of our share of that. But the equipment that we have is, in, I believe it's now about a decade old. And as you can imagine, technology has changed. And so this is, goes back a full year. Uh, we worked with the city, so in their 12-13 budget, they approved a special grant to us of $35,700 to update our equipment to meet modern standards. And that is in the 12-13 budget. Uh, after extensive research, with the staff at MCTV, as well as places like Delta Broadcasting, uh, Scott Cochran and Billy Dumont Oliver have come forward with a proposal, and that's what you see here. We are recommending that we go with the low bidder for the project, Advanced Lighting and Sound of Troy, Michigan. They will procure and install <coughs> the equipment and train our staff for a total price of $38,668. 35.7 of that's covered by the grant and the remaining out of local budgeted numbers. And this is expected to be completed in July after your July board meeting. And we would recommend approval of this so that they can go forward and schedule it. I guess I should say that the highlights of the project include new cameras and controllers, uh, additional microphones, new monitors, cabling, and installation. And it should greatly improve what the viewing audience sees and I'm not sure, will this allow live streaming video of meetings? That's part of what we're doing as well. It's not all included in this. OK. So there, I think there will be some enhanced technology capabilities as well. So we would recommend approval of this. Motion? Move approval of uh, item 4.4, boardroom AV renovation. Moved by Dr. Kaminsky, supported by Ms. Brandstad. Um, any questions or comments? 
I have a question. Are you involved in that with the, the company in Troy? No. Uh, okay. But I, just my general question no. is, can any of these cameras be repurposed uh, for security? We'll have Scott yeah. Cochran come forward. Scott is our curriculum specialist for social Special. studies, yeah. who also, as one of his many duties as otherwise assigned, is responsible for our local TV. <laughs> right. um, I, they actually are cameras that could be used for security purposes. They're 10 years old, which in, you know, as you know, in technology terms makes them pretty, pretty old. But uh, they would be able to be used for that purpose. Okay. As far as what it would take to install them and wire them and make them operational at that level, I don't have that information, but I'm sure we can get that. Great. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. And then John, one question. This is, uh, the majority of this is a grant uh, from an MCTV. And this is no way technology that can be used in a classroom. It's, it's for pur pur purposes of presenting the, uh, you know, the public television and, and that type of thing with a cable TV and Correct. all that. Correct. The grant, which is funding about 93% of the project, mm -hmm. is specifically uh, TV monies from our partnership with the City of Midland and the MCTV station and our partner, Ron Beacom, there. It's uh, specifically, uh, and Linda could tell us the exact term, but it's specifically uh, delineated just for TV expenditures. It cannot yeah. be used for any other purpose. It's restricted. Mm -hmm. It's restricted. And, and just for the public viewing uh, consumption is that this room, and a lot of times this is used for other purposes too. It's not just board meetings. So I know when we have elections, uh, League of Women's Voters, um, and, and I know there's always always meetings in here. The projectors are used and so forth. So we use it for a lot of things, and, uh, like the forum you had today tonight with the uh, Midland High School students and staff that went to Taiwan. When we interview those students, we'd like to use this space, but it's just not a real. It's not as conducive as we would like for that. It's not green. Yes, this will <laughs> yeah. help. Come with on. The this will help with that. Yeah. Get a green wall back. Right. Right. We could broadcast from Taiwan. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I do want to comment that it was very interesting going through the whole superintendent search process, how many people do watch this. Well, and there have been a lot of changes uh, during this last semester uh, with our uh, YouTube site, uh, youtube.com slash user slash Midland Public Schools. Every meeting, every show that we produce on our TV station is also available on the YouTube site now. Not just when it's being broadcast, but people can watch it at any time, including uh, all the superintendent interviews and all of your meetings and the other uh, athletic events, concerts, student events that we put on. So a lot easier for parents, family members, uh, grandparents out of town, that sort of thing to, to see what we're doing. And this will help with everything that we do in here as far as that goes too. And I'd like to thank the MCTV folks oh, yeah. for the donation, Absolutely. I guess, uh, through the cable uh, franchise. And I guess all charter subscribers I should thank also. Yeah, we're very <laughs> appreciative of that part of the <laughs> It's because that's net, net where it's coming from. Okay, any other question or comment? So you now we'll move into a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. You guys have it. We'll move on to the salary adjustment for employee groups by Mr. Allinger. Hey, you have a letter that I would typically read you, but uh, as Linda Klein was uh, going through her PowerPoint presentation, I checked off uh, virtually everything that's in this letter. I'll just mention to you, uh, it's an actionable item for the board. We need to have you approve this tonight if you so desire to. Um, this is a great resource. I think I mentioned this board um, at our workshop that we had back in January with MASB because it gives you the salary schedules for all the different employee groups. It gives you the history on what those salary increases have been or reductions in compensation have been. If you file that somewhere, you will find yourself going back to that regularly. Um, so I won't highlight anything differently because it would be all a repeat. Um, the only one thing that Linda did not mention, um, and it's minor compared to the size of our budget, is pay for athletic workers is broken into three categories to more accurately reflect the current practice. And that's reflected elsewhere in this document. Other than that, she covered 100% of what's there. I'll entertain a motion for the acceptance of the um the uh, salary adjustments. I'll move. Support. Moved by Member McFarland, support by Secretary Kaminsky. Any questions? I have no. none. Okay. Uh, all in favor of accepting, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> the ayes have it. Thank you. And turning it over to Gary Verlindi, layoff reduction teaching staff for this year. Yes, I think Linda has laid out in general terms uh, what our FTE will be for next year as a result of staffing and enrollment and student course selections. 
the unfortunate part is is that um, there are a few layoffs and of course these are situations that are not easy for any of us we have a total of 1.8 FTE that is being reduced here which involves to varying degrees five people uh, I know that you have the resolution in front of you and I will return it to you for that before I read the resolution any questions of Gary have the resolution read and then, and then we need a motion first I assume correct so any other questions of Gary before we go into a motion I'll probably have some at the end but that's fine. Okay. so I'll entertain a motion on this at this point anybody so moved. moved by member Baker support, support by member McFarland at this point uh, why don't we read the resolution mm -hmm. and we'll go to further questions okay okay Midland Public Schools, Midland County, Michigan, uh, the district. A regular meeting of the Board of Education, the board of the district was held at the administration center in the district on the 10th day of June at seven o'clock in the evening. The meeting was called to order by Gerald Wasserman, president. Um, all were present, none were absent. The following preamble and resolution were offered by member Baker and supported by member McFarland. Whereas the Board of Education of the Midland Public Schools has reviewed its projected revenues and expenditures for the 2013-14 school year, school enrollments and curricular needs, and on the basis of the above factors has determined that a reduction in teaching personnel is necessary. Whereas the administration of this school district has notified the Midland City uh, Education Association and affected teachers of the contemplated reductions and whereas the administration of the school district af after reviewing applicable standards pertaining to certification seniority and qualifications of the faculty has recommended separation of particular factor faculty members pursuant to the necessary reduction in personnel now therefore be it resolved number one the following teachers are hereby placed on layoff or reduced contract status effective with the commencement of the 2013-14 school year and their services are hereby discontinued as of that date will not be required until further notice. Um, a, uh, Lisa Billadu, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, 0 0.1 reduction. Kevin Dodick, uh, 0 0.1 reduction. Uh, James uh, Mosca, 1.0 uh, layoff. Shirley Vincent Rose, uh, 0 0.5 reduction. Amanda Toms, uh, 0 0.1 reduction. Number two, the superintendent of the school district is hereby authorized and directed to notify each teacher affected by this resolution in writing that he or she has been placed on layoff or reduced contract status for the 2013-14 school year and that his or her services have been discontinued or reduced and will not be required until further notice. Number three, all resolutions and parts of this resolution insofar as a conflict with the provisions of this resolution be and the same are hereby rescinded. I'll call vote but let's go to discussion first any other questions yeah I just I just wanted a little bit of information it's um, is ha, have we done any any um, additions to staff teaching staff I know in the budget there's a few additions Ad additions for next year I think for elementary staff yeah oh uh, we will be replacing some elementaries because there's some uh, retirements uh, because so of forth. retirements and it's where the retirements fall a lot of times that uh, has an influence on that so, so just kind of in a perfect world, looking at the number of returns we have, and how does it depend upon um, what teachers are able to go? I, I guess I'm kind of wondering is well, certification is the number one thing, especially from secondary and elementary. Those are very, very different uh, certifications. Okay. okay, and then it goes with uh, according to certification, according to subject areas, and where we have the reductions. We had uh, music got hit uh, a little bit harder this year. I, uh, I basically believe that that is due to the consolidation of Central uh, into Jefferson and Northeast had an effect. We had some um, fewer sections. We lost some sections at the secondary level in vocal music, for example, and uh, um, kids took other things maybe, and. Uh, also, we're starting to get into the, this area where we remember we've done layoffs through the elementary and a little bit into the, um, the middle school, but that um, slow growth of students coming in every year 
is now hitting the middle schools and the high schools. And as I project forward, unless we have uh, uh, retirements, et cetera, that's where we'll see more of the layoffs after those many years where we saw most of those at the elementary level. Okay, so it's really not possible for a teacher that teaches at the high school level to always be able to be reassigned to an elementary. That's be rare, rarely. Because of that considerable, so it'd be like a worker in manufacturing you know, that's trained in one area, not being trained in another. It's yeah, and it depends. You're talking about auxiliaries. You're talking about um, core classes. And it varies from auxiliary to auxiliary uh, area based on what the certifications are in that. Some are more K-12. Some are uh, very prescriptive on yeah. uh, what they can teach. So all of those things play into that. I'm good. And I, I'd, I'd like to comment that this is one reason why you want to be very judicious on hiring. Because as you're faced with trends, if you try to solve a short-term need with hiring, and a trend hits you a year or two later, you put a person and a family into reliance on a job that you may not have there for the long term. So as you balance, and I know you do consider that longer term balance right. in meeting needs, and that's very important. And you're always sensitive to the fact that if you are bringing somebody into the district, if that job is not there after one year, these people could have moved <coughs> from another community and then have that happen. So we try to be very judicious about that. And Gary, equally important, I would think, would be your reassurance to uh, uh, the board that the reassignment process is following the new law. That's changed. That's caused us to take performance into consideration uh, when it has to be. Seniority is not the consideration that it used to be in the past. It's not the determinant. But from a board member's point of view, to protect their liability as board members, we want to be able to offer the reassurance that we're following the law with its changes. We're following your board policy and we're following the teacher contract. And I think we can give that to you, correct? You bet. And so if things change over the summer, there's the potential these people. And that, do, that does okay. happen. We do the, have turnover during the summer. That goes, that In some of these do. cases, it'll be dependent upon <coughs> um, where that turnover is and what subject area, et cetera. Yeah. And I, I think in previous uh, budgets, we've had s greater number of retirements because of the incentives. And it's been a while since we've had to face this as a board, unfortunately. So we did it. We had no uh, layoffs last year, for example. Right. No, this is not the fun part of the job. <coughs> okay. Any other comments? Oh, with that, we'll do a roll call vote. Go ahead. <coughs> President Wasserman. Yes. Vice President Baker. Yes. Secretary Kaminsky. Myself. Yes. Treasurer Brandstant. Member Gordon? Yes. Member McFarland? Regrettably, yes. Member Vanderkill? Uh, yes. 7 vote? Yes. But I do think we should focus on attracting students back to the district so we don't have to continue in this decline. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, and that comes to, comes to me. Uh, before we do that, uh, the Secretary just reminded me that uh, we may need to extend. Mm -hmm. uh, can I take a motion to extend to 10 o'clock? We'll be done by then. So I move we extend to 10 o'clock. I'll support. Yep. Moved by Treasurer Branch, I support by Secretary Kaminsky to go to extend the meeting time. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hopefully we can beat that significantly. <laughs> okay, uh, the next subject is what we've been dealing with as a board for the last uh, month, it seems like the last year, although <laughs> uh, a lot of time expended, and that's the final board approval of uh, Mr. Mike Charles' contract with Mount Public Schools. Um, I'm pleased to announce that uh, Angela and I, uh, first the committee of Angela, Lynn, and I met along with our consultant to understand the landscape of compensation these days. Uh, Aunt Lynn was unable to attend, but uh, Angela and I went down and uh, met with Mr. Sherrill. I am pleased to say we came to a very quick agreement. Uh, we've completed up the language over the next two days after that, and we had agreement by Friday afternoon. So it took a whole whopping three days. So um, that, that was very good. Let me give some highlights of the new contract. Uh, the term will be for three years, starting July 1st of 2013. An annual salary, salary of $161,000. There is no annuity and no deferred pay involved in this contract. Uh, the health insurance will be the same plan as all administrative employees, highlighted by the um, 
employee contributions premiums that Linda talked about during the budget presentation. Other insurance will be the same as the administrative employees. Vacation of 25 days with a carryover max of 35. Uh, there's moving expense to take the lower of two professional bids to pack, move, and unpack goods. No housing, no any, any touch of a house involved by the district, uh, not to exceed $10,000. And there's upgraded language on termination, conflict of interest, outside work, evaluation, and extension of term, uh, both to get better state of the art of the language and also comply with recent school act changes. Um, I guess I would uh, entertain a motion to accept the contract, and then we can have discussion and questions about it. I move we accept the contract. I support. Move, move by Member Gordon, uh, supported by Treasurer Brandstadt. Any questions? So this is the final, bring them on board. Bring them on board. This, okay. this will be the last official action other than Cindy will be mailing back an original signed copy tomorrow. <laughs> that will be the last official action in terms of the search process. And, of course, then the big process becomes into uh, inculcating Mike and his wife into our community and community. Yeah. And Carl will be working a lot with that, and so will us. So He's excited. He already had his house on the market before we met with him. So yes. <laughs> very excited. Very excited. W once to get to that market as everybody's moving, maybe for the <laughs> summer, the, the, this kind of the season. Yeah. Any others? I, I, I'm just excited. I'm really excited to bring a new leader into the district, and uh, and um, it's uh, just full of uh, opportunity. And, and um, it won't. Be, uh, I don't think he's coming into a, a very uh, very straightforward uh, s situation to be in, and it's the same with his existing district. So. There aren't many districts you get to move into these days in the state of Michigan that aren't facing very, very similar challenges. Right. Um, I would like to, before we vote, I'd also like to thank the board uh, and our community. Uh, you guys did a great job in terms of uh, the open process. That's a difficult process. It's awkward for board members. It's awkward for candidates to very publicly display uh, your thoughts on someone. And yeah, we all did very well. Um, earlier point was made about the TV. I've received dozens, at least dozens of comments from people in the community about what they've seen and liked, and that was valuable input. Not to mention the poor candidates out in their home districts being uh, viewed by their by their staffs and their community, what they have to say. They all watched as we learned when we went down there. So anyway, thank you, everybody, very much. And I'd like to thank you, Jerry, for your leadership. It's, it was a lot, and it was fast, and you had hours and hours and hours of extra work, and we appreciated that. Very much. And Cindy, you as well many, many hours and many nights that you shared with us rather than being at home. So, In Including her anniversary day. Yes, yes. Her anniversary. Right. Yeah. We're not going to let that go. So no. we'll do a, I'd like to do a roll call vote on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so Secretary, if you'll call the votes. Absolutely. President Wasserman. Yes. Vice President Baker. Yes. Secretary Kaminsky, myself, yes. And Treasurer Branstad. Yes. Member Gordon. Yes. Member McFarland. Yes. Member Vander Kellen. Definitely, definitely, yes. All right, seven zero vote, mm. and thank you very much, uh, Mike. And uh, if you're watching, or you watch tomorrow morning when you see this, uh, we're returning the signed contract to you tomorrow morning, and welcome aboard. And with that, Lynn, you already commented, and I'd like to comment personally. Um, it was a lot of time by a lot of people, and there's a lady here who did two jobs during all that time. Uh, one, working for Carl, like she normally does, and unfortunately for about a month working for me, and uh, I really appreciate those efforts, including the anniversary. And as such, oh. we have a token of, oh. of our appreciation. <laughs> and I don't know if the TV can catch this or see me, but uh, notice the ribbon colors. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you did wonderful. Thank you. I tried to surprise you with those. I couldn't see if you could see them under the desk or not. <laughs> <laughs> and you sat at that desk the whole evening. It took a long time for you to go to the copy room so I could sneak those in. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the, the next item of the agenda. And we're going to go to finance. And we're going to have an FFO report by our treasurer. All right, I'll try to make this quick, although the meeting wasn't. <laughs> so we met last. Okay, it was last Monday we met, not Tuesday. And um, let's see, we uh, went over uh, 
Um, the first thing we did was go over um, an update on the assessment negotiations, and I think we have more of that later on. I think we're meeting in closed session. Um, for finance, uh, Mrs. Laux gave a quick overview of the April financial reports, and then Mrs. Klein gave us um, much similar to what we saw tonight, presentation on the budget, and of course we spent a lot of time talking about that. Um, we also talked about um, that Chartwells is recommending an increase to school lunch prices, so we are going to have the administration go back and just look at the na our neighboring districts to see where we currently are at in relationship to um, other neighboring districts with our current lunch prices before we make a decision on that. Um, Mrs. Klein also showed us a couple great um, websites that have um, district information, and you can compare our district to other districts. And um, so that these minutes are on. Line, right so people can go online and see the um, two websites if you're interested in looking at those uh, for facilities we talked about a um, current list of property that Midland Public Schools owns that we don't use for schools um, and we had some discussion about Mills Elementary and we also had some discussions the grounds building across the street from here it's um, roof is leaking badly and beyond repair and so they are currently looking at getting bids for that <coughs> um, the next thing we talked about were middle school pools which we have a joint um, agreement with the Midland Community Center they've been maintaining the pools for what the last two years I believe and so there's some relatively small repairs that need to be made so we are going to split the cost of those with the Midland Community Center. Total costs over two years not to exceed $17,000. And then we also talked about, um, which I guess will be on the agenda tonight, it says, to purchase um, some, well, we talked about the future of the iPads. And part of that is to um, potentially purchase a couple more carts of iPads for next year. And then that their current um, proposal is to have this year's iPad staying with this year's teachers, but it will get a whole nother group of students that will get to experience that this coming year. Um, we also had some discussion about the election. Um, many hypotheses on why the um, Two things did not pass, but voter turnout does not appear to be the issue because the um, turnout was consistent with prior special election votes that we've had. Our next meeting will be in September. Any question or comment? And that's out on the table for anybody's reading pleasure. Seeing none, we'll move on to Linda. We have gifts totaling $25,665.25 that we have already received and processed. Uh, Midland High School Athletic Booster Club is wrapping up their year with um, gifts for a number of different sports, including they agreed to cover the winter and spring sports regular season entry fees, which then freed up some of the general fund dollars for other items within the athletics. The Dow Chemical Community Gives Fund at the Midland Area Communi Community Foundation uh, provided two different grants, one to cover registration fees for the Midland High School attendance at the Michigan Student Council Association's Leadership Conference, and another to repair the Midland High School softball fields. And just as a reminder, the Community Gives grants require that the receiving entity, in this case uh, some student groups, perform some form of community service. So it's a way of paying it forward. They receive dollars, but then they provide what they're able to do for another organization. Uh, Ladies Auxiliary, number 3651 of the Veterans of Foreign Wars provided some support for a program that we run with our special education department and Midland community businesses. Uh, the Mary E. McIntyre Memorial Athletic Fund, also at the Community Foundation, provided support for Midland High School baseball scoreboard, and you'll see a second gift related to that. <coughs> and then finally, the Midland Kiwanis Foundation Agency provided gifts for three teachers, and I should mention that the last of those three gifts were all deferred for the 13-14 school year because they all represent items that it's too late to purchase for this year. We do have one gift that is for $10,000, not $100,000, as you see under the amount. That probably would come as a surprise to Meyer. Uh, <laughs> and this is a sponsorship for the Midland High School Baseball Scoreboard to be combined with some of the other funds 
Uh, in particular, you see the Mary E. McIntyre Memorial Athletic Fund, the Community Foundation, and this will replace uh, the scoreboard on the baseball field at Midland High School. And that does require your gift, but again, it will be deferred to the next fiscal year. Requires your action. Yep. Yeah, I, I caught that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I accept a motion for item nine, the Meyer donation for the baseball, uh, the baseball stadium scoreboard. So moved. Support. Moved by Member Gordon. Support <coughs> by Secretary Kaminsky. Any discussion? Thank you. Thank you, Meyer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes. Thank very you. Nice. With that, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it. And thank you. Yes, we haven't even approved the 1314 budget, and the gifts are rolling, <laughs> rolling in, in that already. little category that we build in. Uh, next item is the pool agreement, as you heard mentioned in the minutes. And two years ago, we were looking at closing our two middle school pools, and the community center uh, stepped forward with a proposal that they raise some funds and that they take over operations and perform some um, repairs. And in exchange for that, we agreed to keep our pools open for two years. It's hard to believe, but the two years have passed. Uh, the pools are still worth keeping open as long as we don't put too much money into them. And the community center has approached us then with another two-year agreement. This would keep the pools open through the 2014-15 school year. And we would agree to split the cost over two years of uh, some repair work at both Northeast and at Jefferson. Our part of this would be no more than $8,500 each year, and as would be their share. And as part of this, they would agree to cover the operational costs for the pools, which includes but is not limited to pool chemicals, pump repair, filters, and other mechanical or equipment costs. Our expenses would be to pay for the associated utility costs uh, within the temperature parameters that are required for a pool, and any instructional equipment and supplies associated with our classes using the pool during the instructional day. And we would grant them the primary use of both pools for after school, holidays, and weekend use, unless we agree otherwise. So we would request your approval of that agreement for another two years. I, I should also mention that we agree to do this and keep those pools open unless additional repairs beyond this would exceed $15,000, $15,000. At that point, we would have to revisit whether it was worth uh, any additional money from any party. I entertain a motion. I move. Support. Moved by Treasurer Branstad, support by Member Barland. Uh, any questions or discussion? I John. Do. With the, without keeping the pools maintained in our partnership with that, if the pools weren't there, would the students miss out on part of their, their curriculum and training with the, you know, how the pools fit into that? We benefit greatly from having the pools there, not only because we, we do have a, a number of students who enjoy taking a swimming class, but it does provide instructional space for us within each building. And we've been able to maintain swimming as part of our curriculum, even though S Central doesn't have a pool, by having an agreement for, with the community center for the students to go over there. So I, the ability to continue to offer swimming mm -hmm. to our middle school students, it's not required. They Certainly they don't all take it, but for those who do, I, I think it's a plus. And they've had that for some time. And, and there was a time where swimming was a requirement of all seventh graders. <laughs> and they're done yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Any other questions? I just make a comment. I, I spoke with one of the swim teachers uh, one day, and it was interesting the percentage of students that really, truly do not know how to swim. And they learn through those classes. I was, act I was shocked at how many. They think they know how to swim because they hang around the pool or the lake. But so as long as we're able to provide this, this education and this skill for them, it's, it really truly is a, a good, a good thing for everyone. It's a good point. Any other? Living in Michigan. Yeah. yeah, and I think the community center, our relationship with them on our athletics has mm -hmm. been great yeah. and uh, very innovative a few years ago, and that's really good. Okay, on call for a vote. 
Um, all in favor, 5.3, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. We'll move to Human Resources. Mr. Berlindi. Yes, we have two staff members who have announced their retirement, and they're both effective June 12th. That'd be Michael Ordaway, bus driver with transportation, and Linda Jane Stropal, paraprofessional with transportation. Do you want to segue into technology? Sure. Okay, uh, we are um, recommending the purchase through Trivalent Group, uh, the purchase of 60 Hewlett Packard 6570B laptop computers, as well as configuration and two no uh, notebook managed uh, charging carts. And uh, they, these come later in the year than we normally would do. We've been holding back from um, uh, going ahead and purchasing those. These are in the budget from this year's technology budget. And you remember we reprioritized some of that budget to do the iPad initiative, but we knew that uh, we had a few labs that uh, we're going to need to be replaced. We were holding on it till after the election, hoping that this, well, this would have been covered and it was part of our uh, plan should the uh, uh, technology bond have passed. Well, obviously that did not. We have that money still in the budget that we've been um, holding just in uh, case of this eventuality. And you got to remember that last year in doing the iPad initiative, we put off a year of upgrading um, uh, some of our labs and replacing some of the uh, laptops that are with uh, teachers. And we'll address a little bit more of that um, as we get into next year's budget. But we'd like to purchase these as part of the targeted replacement of some labs. The current labs that we're starting with, and there are more that we'll be talking about at a future date, um, the, they were uh, are now six years old. And by the end of this year, if we didn't replace them, uh, would be seven years old, and that can be, as you well know, very problematic as far as running uh, various softwares, et cetera. The one difference is, is that instead of uh, purchasing desktops in these cases, we're going to go with mobile carts. It gives us space uh, for one. Secondly, we don't want to invest in too many desktops except for specific purposes um, because in the future, um, if we were to go with a bond proposal, et cetera, those would be things that may not um, serve us over the uh, length of five, six years. Whereas the laptops, if we purchase those for these labs, and let's say at some point we go with a technology bond, and this, th this would be, these could all be repurposed into other areas of the district uh, as part of the replacement cycle for teachers, which was built into the bond proposal, et cetera. So it gives us a lot of uh, different options. It gives us a start on replacing uh, some of these labs here. Um, in June, um, because any other purchases that we do in replacing labs would have to come after July 1st. As you well know, summer is big time for technology in trying to get these things uh, up and running and installed before the beginning of the instructional year when those classrooms are being used. May I entertain a motion? So moved. Moved by Member, uh, Vice President Baker. Second, support, support by Dr. Kaminsky. Questions over here? Okay, seeing none, uh, I'll move into a roll call vote, please. Sure. President Wasserman? Yes. Vice President Baker? Yes. Secretary Kaminsky, myself, yes. Treasurer Branstent? Yes. Member Gordon? Yes. Member McFarland? Yes. Member Vanderkelm? Yes. 7 0, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, Next item on the agenda, you will see listed correspondence to and from the Board of Education and a list of our uh, upcoming meetings for the public. Our next meeting is the same time, same place on June Monday, June 24th in this room. Um, at this point, we move into study discussion session. I don't know where I started last time. Um, I'll start to my left since Scott's scaring at me. Sure. In the, uh, given the late hour, in the interest of time and getting our audience who have graciously been with us for nearly three hours, I will withhold comment. I just want to congratulate all the graduates and once again thanks Jerry and Cindy for all their hard work on the superintendent search. I know how much time I put in and I, you guys probably put three, four X times that in. So thank you. 
also congratulations to the uh, the new graduates. It was just one of the best experiences being able to hand out diplomas to our students, and it, it really is amazing to share in that moment and that opportunity to um, allow our, our students to go forward to the next levels and on with their life. It, it was I cherish that opportunity. Uh, welcome to Mr. Sharo, our next superintendent. Uh, we look forward to working with you. Um, and also thanks to the Gerstacker Foundation for allowing uh, for the trips to the Taiwan for the students to spur some thinking, some uh, thinking in uh, different um, different ways about education, how it's done, not just here in Michigan, but globally. Um, and also, lastly, I, I did make my phone calls um, with the notification of the Common Core uh, being delayed and uh, not being a part of the budget. I talked to our legislators, and uh, my understanding is that that still could be a possibility going into next year. I know it is delayed, but um, it, I think that there's some um, need to uh, look at regulation, how do, how do changes occur once the Common Core is there. Um, so I think we wait and uh, see where that goes. Um, we did ask some questions about funding levels, you know, why Midland Public? Um, and I know sometimes board members are criticized that we don't talk to our legislators enough. And uh, what Linda Klein had said in her presentation is that there sort of is a culture in Lansing and there maybe isn't the votes to increase funding to all school districts equally, um, even though the promises of Proposal A's, or I should say the weaknesses of Proposal A. Um, and uh, it's, it's just hard to believe that um, that that is not working out in Midland Public Schools' favor. Um, but I, I look forward to the Common Core being given further consideration, especially after two or three years or more work being done by educators to implement that. And I just think with the mobility of society and so many people around the country that could be a benefit also to help us be uh, compared to international standards. I don't want to drag things out <coughs> any further, but I would like to say too that I did appreciate all your time and hard work, Jerry, and how you really led us through that. I really appreciated that not having been through it before, so thank you for all your help on that. And you too, Cindy, and I think um, you're just amazing, and the fact that you spent your anniversary with us was just over the top. <laughs> <laughs> She got flowers tonight. <laughs> just I to know, explain where those flowers came from. <laughs> I know, but I did really appreciate all your help. I really did. So thank you very much. <clears throat> well, I would congratulate the graduates as well. It's always a fun evening. And wow, this year was probably the coolest year in my 12 years. And, and that made it even more pleasant. So <laughs> congratulations to all of, all of the graduates and their families. It's, it's a very special night. And um, I'd also like to say thank you to our, all the staff and students and, and administrators. It's been, a, it's been a great year. Uh, and I think we saw evidence of that tonight with, once again, with seeing great things that our students and staff do. And, uh, and they did it in Taipei, which is a, just amazing to have that experience. And then I was, I was going to go back to uh, one of the gifts. I talked to a little gal this weekend at one of the open houses that attended the Michigan Student Council Association Leadership Conference. And uh, very excited because Mid Midland actually did several of the presentations for the other high schools. And she said it was really fun to be on the, on the presenting end. They always bring back new ideas, but they're very proud of a lot of the programs and activities they do. And then this has been a very unusual year for me. I don't typically miss board meetings, but unfortunately next, the next meeting um, is my annual trip with, with a teenage outreach group. And I will be in Davenport, Iowa. And I will be thinking of the rest of you because I know you will be recognizing Carl and Kathy at their last MPS board meeting and uh, wishing them well in their retirement. So I just want to take a few minutes to personally express my gratitude to both of you. Kathy, it has been a pleasure to know you and work with you the past 12 years on the Curriculum Study Committee. We have enjoyed many fun and interesting meetings and visits to the classrooms where we saw the curriculum, students, and teachers in action. From kindergarten reading, first grade chicks hatching, fifth grade iPad projects, the middle school world of technology, and high school IB classes, welding, building trades, and so much more. The curriculum continues to grow and evolve, which is challenging and exciting. Thank you for your dedication and the part you have played in making MPS an outstanding school district, and I wish you well in the years to come. Carl, it is bittersweet, as I wish you well tonight. As I reflected on the past six years, I was not sure where to begin. 
Then remembering you began your career in education as an English teacher, I decided what better way to share my thoughts than through some keywords and definitions that I feel represent you. Caring, meaning conscientious, concerned, or interested. You always make an effort to care about others. When faced with decisions, you make them with concern in what is in the best interest of others, but most importantly, the students. Attentive, observant, listens, courteous, considerate, thoughtful. You genuinely care about others in and out of school. Even in difficult situations, you are willing to meet with others, listen, and are considerate and respectful of their opinions and feelings. Active meaning causing or an initiating action or change, contributing, participating, busy. From initiating the creation of the district vision statement soon after your arrival in Midland, forming district committees, communicating with Lansing, supporting technology in the future of education, you have led and made many contributions to the continued success of MPS, plus the hundreds of academic, music, drama, and athletic events you have attended over the years. Real, genuine, authentic, true. You are genuine, honest, kind, and full of integrity. You are true to yourself and others. As you and others once said when you first arrived, what you see is what you get. Leader is a guide, influential voice, points, or shows the way by setting an example. You have guided the district through some very challenging years where very difficult decisions have had to be made. Through it all, you set an example by staying focused, positive, respectful, and encouraging others to do so as well. Retirement means live at leisure. My wish for you is many happy, healthy, relaxing years, filled with time to do what you want, when you want. It is well deserved. And finally, thanks, an expression of gratitude. Carl, thank you only begins to express the gratitude I have for the privilege to know and work with you the past six years. You have encouraged, taught, and been a mentor to me as well as many others. I wish you, Gail and Katie, all the best as you begin the next chapter of your life. I uh, just want to say it was an honor to be part of the Midland High graduation. And I also wanted to bring up um, the Common Core delay. I think this might be an opportunity, and I know it's going to have to be a quick change, but to move forward more with the IB, as we have found from the curriculum directors that uh, the IB aligns with the Common Core. So it will still be moving us in that direction, even if we aren't going full force into the Common Core. Something we should think about. To me, how very short uh, graduation was great again, 10 years of doing it. Uh, just ask all of our graduates and parents to be very safe with all the graduation parties going on. You know, let's not have a tragedy. Mm. People aren't paying attention driving and walking around. So, Carl. I'll be very quick to uh, put the focus back on students here at Midland High School. Midland High's Emily Mar Marin and John Reeves and Kellen Bixler traveled to Raleigh, North Carolina to compete at the 29th Annual American Computer Science League All-Star Contest. 15 U.S. and interna international teams were invited to compete in the three-person senior division. The Midland High team earned 73 out of a possible 76 points, including a perfect 40 of 40 in programming. That earned them second place, only missing first place, uh, which was won by a Romanian team by just a single point. So that's pretty incredible for uh, our students over at Midland High. Also, uh, Jeff Schuster, the MPS Varsity Lacrosse coach, was named the Coach of the Year for Lacrosse in the Saginaw Valley League on May 24th. Uh, congratulations to this um, very deserving coach. And also at Midland High, congratulations to Miles Kilbreth and Aaron Chapman on their performance at the track and field state finals. Miles finished fifth in the 1600 meter run. Aaron finished seventh in the 400 meter dash. They both earned all state honors. Great job to all the state qualifiers. Mar uh, Miles and Aaron both have been selected to represent Midland High in the state of Michigan in the Midwest Meet of Champions on Saturday, June 15th. And then a general recognition, congratulations to uh, all the graduates from me as well. I was at Dow with three of you. It was a wonderful uh, uh, graduation. Uh, Friday's commencement ceremonies were wonderful. We wish our 2013 graduates all the best in the future with their academic and employment endeavors. 
And then as we celebrate another great school year, we want to thank all our dedicated staff for all that you do for students, one of whom waited out the whole board meeting, Mrs. Jocks in the back. So <laughs> wave at us so they know who you are, <laughs> uh, Mrs. Jocks. We wish all of our students a fun, relaxing summer filled reading good books by your very favorite authors. Okay, with that, um, we can move to closed session, take a motion to move to closed session. But before I do, we're going to need to extend. Can I have a motion to extend to some time? I move we extend to 10.30. Support. Move to 10.30 by Treasurer Branstad, supported by Secretary Kaminsky. Any questions or comments? Oh, you guys are pushing it. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, we are extended to 10.30, and now I have to take a motion to move into closed session. Yes. Uh, I move we go into closed session. Support. Support. <laughs> Moved and seconded right here again. Okay. <laughs> uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we're going to move into closed session. I suggest at the late hour, this could be a quick session. Let's not take a long, let's not take a break. Let's just clear the room and, and move on. Back. We're back in open session after uh, coming out of closed. Um, Gary, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, we're pl uh, glad to announce that we have reached a tentative agreement with uh, Macespa, our uh, educational support group, grant maintenance and grounds, and uh, uh, Cynthia Marchese, our chief spokesman, our spokeswoman, uh, for uh, the district in this negotiation. We'll fill you in on the details. Okay, well, we have uh, been negotiating um, since about October and have come to agreement on Tuesday um, of a two-year contract that includes this current school year, the 12-13 school year, and for the 13-14 school year, um, which will expire at the end of September 2014. Zero wage um, percent increase, sorry, zero percent wage increase for each of the two years. Um, minor changes in the SEP on the wage schedule, which actually will move forward into future years, not affecting anybody currently. Um, some concessions to the group on their medical co-pays, um, such as doctor visits, urgent cares, and um, the ER visits. Um, minor language changes, and there is a small stipend for members to earn upon completion for up to 12 hours of safety training um, for the 13-14 year. So tonight, I guess I bring to you my recommendation to ratify the contract with the Masespa group um, that it consists of the skilled trades and grounds employees. Entertain a motion. Move to ratify the contract. Support. Moved by Member McFarland, support by Treasurer Branstad. Any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, we'll move into a vote. I can do this as a voice vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. We have a ratified contract. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, it's been a very long meeting. Thank you for everybody's patience, and we'll see you in two weeks.